Hello, good day. My name is Jonathan Holloway. On behalf of the whole team, it's my great pleasure to extend to you a very warm welcome in the first of today's series of high-level dialogues organised by the British Council in partnership with the World Cities Culture Forum. Over the next six hours, we have three great panels with speakers from around the world representing six continents and with people joining us, watching and asking questions from all over the world, including Mexico City, New York, Mombasa, Istanbul, Islamabad, Toronto, Kyiv, and right here in London. These sessions are part of the lead up to Mondia Cult 2022, UNESCO's World Conference on Cultural Practice, Policies and Sustainable Development, which is taking place in September in Mexico, where ministers of culture from across the world will meet. The aim of today's sessions is to hear from top professionals um, and from yourselves about what exactly we should be discussing at this moment. What we, should we be putting to those ministers? What are the recommendations we want on policy and planning? How can we recommend how UNESCO moves forward with its approach to culture and the creative industries? Now, I'm delighted we have a great panel to start off the series. Um, we have people joining us from around the world, as I've said, but um, we're going to start with a, a message from uh, the Minister for Arts in the United Kingdom, Lord Parkinson. As the UK's Minister for Arts, I'd like to warmly welcome you to this international forum and high level policy dialogue, which is being hosted by the British Council and organised with the World Cities Culture Forum. As the Regional Bureau Member for Mondiacult and the official Delegate of the United Kingdom, I'm delighted that the British Council is hosting this event to inform the discussions that will take place in Mexico in late September. Mondiacult 2022 will be a momentous occasion for nations and cultural actors uh, to come together to share expertise and to collaborate on cultural policies and sustainable development. The UK is strongly committed to the role of culture in global development. Our heritage, our living cultures and our creative economies play a vital role in addressing social, economic and environmental challenges at a local, national and global level. That's why the topic of today's session is so important and the British Council is well placed to bring together different cultural representatives and agencies to advance policy and practice in this area. Working in partnership, it'll be a chance to look back and reflect on culture as the missing pillar of development, as well as to look beyond 2030 towards a future where culture is recognised for the core part it can play in building the world we all want to see. I hope that this event will be a fruitful dialogue and I look forward to hearing more about the recommendations and calls to action which arise from it in the lead up to Mondiacult. The UK remains committed to our shared responsibility to protect and promote our heritage and culture. I look forward to working together to ensure that it not only survives but thrives for generations to come. Thank you, Lord Parkinson, uh, for those words. Uh, we're now very happy to be welcoming Stephen Stenning, uh, who is the Global Director of Culture in Action at the British Council, to also say a few words. Stephen. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me, um, because actually I'm, I'm doing this on my iPhone, because having, having arranged a, a great background that showed Dundee, which is where I am, uh, my laptop crashed, so um, I thought I, I never thought that there'd be a time where I wish I had a selfie stick. Anyway, my role is really to firstly to thank Lord Parkinson for setting the scene so effectively. And on behalf of British Council, I want to really echo the importance of these dialogues and thank UNESCO and, and the government of Mexico through its cultural ministry for including these sessions as part of the road to Mondiacult. I think the sessions are not just important, but also timely. Well, actually, I'm not sure timely is significant enough as a word. There is an urgent need to ensure that our, our ways of being are sustainable and that we are collaborating, cooperating effectively as humans over the many challenges that face us. And I, I think that is not just about policies on a statute book, but it's about a need for models and different approaches, a cultural change and a change in the focus we give to culture in the pursuit of collective and agreed targets for sustainability. International cultural cooperation is vital for the change we need. Personally, I think a part of that is about 
new understandings and definitions for international development built around cultural cooperation so we can better address challenges through culture and use creativity and imagination to model alternative approaches for an inclusive and sustainable future. The British Council's core mission is establishing cultural relations that support mutual and collaborative approaches. We've aligned our work to look at culture's response to global challenges, particularly through valuing, preserving and, and nurturing cultural heritage, as, as, as Lord Parkinson highlighted, but also stimulating global conversations around climate change, inspiring action and encouraging inclusive approaches to sustainable development for a better shared future. So a big thank you to the World Cities Cultural Forum for all they've done for, and, and for facilitating this dialogue. And we look forward to generating momentum in the build up to and at Mondia Cult, but more importantly, towards transformatory international cultural cooperation. Thank you. Stephen, thank you so much. Um, now, our first panel of the day is uh, culture at the heart of public policy. We want these sessions to be as interactive as possible. So we're using Slido. Um, if you, you can, uh, the information is on your screen now, but if you uh, log into Slido or, or, or look up them up using the QR code and then go to this code, which is 9259330. This gives you your chance to both ask questions in the Q&A panel, but also answer polls. So we will ask you questions, you will ask us questions and we will all get to know each other a lot better. So hopefully you're now getting into Slido, you're looking it up, you're thinking this is excellent. Uh, and I'm going to ask you a first icebreaker question, which is um, in the polls, um, we want to just tell us one word or more than one word, if, if obviously the place you're joining us from has more than one word, where in the world are you joining us for from? So please answer in, uh, in one or two words, depending on how many words the place requires. Thank you. So where are you joining from us, joining us from? And from there, we can begin to see a pattern and get an idea of exactly who is from where and how we can shape the conversation as we move forward. Doing very well in London. Brussels, Brussels, coming straight in, heavy with Brussels, excellent. Mexico City. Now Mexico City and Mexico have divided themselves um, cleverly, so London is now back in the lead. I, we can't do this all day, um, but we, well, I mean we can, and we're going to. But uh, in the meantime, uh, now we've got a sense of that. Ah, wait a minute, actually, this is getting quite interesting. East London has come in on its own as a breakaway state. So that's, uh, that's uh, not surprising, uh, but it is exciting. Um, hello, Puebla. Hello, Buenos Aires. Hello, Goldsmiths, University of London, a, a nation state unto itself. Belgrade, Johannesburg. Um, uh, there we go. Great. Thank you. Now, next question. We would like to know you better. We would like to know which bit of the world you work in and where you're from. Uh, what are you? Are you an artist? Are you a cultural manager? Are you a cultural promoter, a policymaker? Are you an NGGO, charity, civil society, a cultural leader, community member, student, or the increasingly popular other? Uh, so if you'd like to, uh, and obviously this, you can uh, do this in either English or Spanish, uh, but I am going to do it in English uh, for the sake of everybody here. Um, here we go, a lot of cultural managers, a lot of people in policy. Fabulous. Right, well, while you carry on doing that, um, and we see that uh, we have a majority of people who are cultural managers, um, but also a lot of policymakers, quite a few artists. While that continues, um, I'm going to introduce our first panel who are going to share with us um, their thoughts uh, about this morning's, uh, this afternoon's subject. This morning, if you're in part of the world, this afternoon, if you're in another bit. So our question is, how much is culture recognised as a contributing factor to local and national public policies in your country and context? In what ways can cultural cooperation strengthen development policies at a local and global level? And what more can be done? What actions can be taken individually and collectively? How can we put cities at the heart 
of everything we do at the heart of our activities. I'm welcomed by, I'm joined by three extraordinary guests. First of all, Tita Larazati, who is Director of Strategic Partnerships at Indonesia Creative Cities Network and a member of the International Advisory Council of Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Center in the UK. By Madalena Morena Mujica, Executive Director of the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies. Um, and by Maria Garcia Holly, who is from the British Council in Mexico. Uh, we also have uh, extra comments from Johannes Ebert, who is Secretary General and Chairman of the Board of the Goethe Institute. Uh, but I'd like to start off by saying, welcome all of you. Um, Tita, would you like to share with us your observations and experiences on this today's, today's topic? Uh, yes, thank you. Hi, Jonathan. This is evening here, so hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, so yeah, uh, coming from a community background, although I'm also a lecturer in uh, design and creativity, but uh, looking at how the notion goes now, usually especially in Indonesia, because uh, young people are grouping themselves to what they're interested in, and we start to realize that uh, we cannot rely no uh, we cannot rely any longer to the extracting economy, which means just digging minerals, cutting trees, and so on. So most of our groups are moving into intersecting economy. So we're using the ideas, creativity, and so on and technology helps a lot and also the uh, social media and so on uh, people start to get this word kind of startups this and that so anyway uh, given the indonesia is such a big country with uh, well i live in bandung which is very urban but we also have people in islands and remote areas in coastal areas and so on so when we realized that in communities we met with each other we make our network and then um, we thought, okay, how can we make this matter? Because uh, also in our country, uh, development is always uh, heavy on the infrastructure, uh, education, for example, health, and so on. Creativity and culture is uh, maybe number three, two or three. So then we gathered ourselves in 2015, and we thought let's have a kind of a set of principles and so on that we can hold on to, to make the development matter. And then uh, later, when we joined UNESCO Creative Cities Network, uh, of course, the commitment is to use our potentials and creativity to uh, to influence the development of our own uh, respective cities. So then when we make our set of uh, principles and we make the tools to uh, to implement those principles, we connect it or we adapting the our government's KPI for development. So our offer was if you do uh, what we do in our principles, then your uh, performance index will raise so that's how we try to influence our government to do that and in doing so we also help our local governments to uh, draft for example regulation for creative economy and then also uh, at, the, at the wider level we also join uh, for example g20 urban 20 and so on to make policy recommendations about inclusive creative economy and the future of work and uh, up to today, so now that G20 is uh, hosted in Indonesia, we are also involved in some uh, policy recommendations that are using our uh, best practices or prototypes of how we can do this uh, by, by giving proof because we know that governments, uh, sometimes they are too slow to catch up with the newest trend. Well, we at the community and also in professional, uh, we, we get changes really quick, uh, but law and regulations are really slow in, in following us. So uh, that's uh, so far what we do. And that's how we try to connect with also our regional uh, regional partners, like in Southeast Asia and so on. And in the International Advisory Council of PEC in UK, uh, we also got connected to other countries with similar conditions and so on. So we are learning from each other how to uh, especially influence our government to make uh, policy and regulations that fit us. That's it, Jonathan, thank you. Thank you, Tita, that was fantastic. Um, and beautifully to time, and uh, but also very, very informative. I think the idea of extracting communities and intersecting communities is something we will absolutely uh, come back to. Uh, the next person I'm going to ask to say a few words is Madalena. Uh, Madalena, would you like to share from your point of view on this subject? 
Certainly. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I'm on Boiwaroi, Boiwaroi um, East Kula Nation land that is in the east side of Victoria in Australia. So I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, although I am from Chile originally. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, four very big questions, Jonathan. So maybe I'll just uh, give a quick overview in terms of how we see things through our lens at IFICA, which is the International Federation of Arts Councils and Ministries of Culture. We're about 80 countries around the world. Um, for us, the big question around, is, it, is culture recognized enough? We would always advocate not enough. And that I think that the pandemic has demonstrated just how much we need culture and creative expression in our lives. Um, we always find it quite useful to look at the way in which policy development um, we think should be integrated uh, in terms of not only cultural policy, but in terms of public policy setting. And it's really looking at the cultural value chain. So that is looking at creation, uh, uh, presentation, distribution, and then participation in cultural life. So if we look at it holistically in that sense, um, we start to recognize that there are opportunities or instances where there is quite effective government involvement, policy development at a national, regional, state and city level. But then when we go deeper and deeper, we actually realize that generally it's, um, it's fragmented. And I guess that's where hopefully um, the opportunity that Mondia Cook provides and you know the great work that the British Council and all other types of multilateral organizations do and the, the the cities forum can really push this agenda of connecting the dots and I echo what Tita has said in terms of that in intersectionality two points I would like to make is cultural cooperation essential absolutely does it need to be strengthened both at a global and a local level Definitely. And again, going back to that intersection, um, how is culture di in dialogue with other sectors? I think again, the dialogue with health, the dialogue in terms of the climate crisis, the dialogue in terms of even the geopolitical realities that we're living at the moment, um, there is a real opportunity for that voice to be stronger than ever. Um, and there are two very practical sort of sides to it. One, which is more about the sector and we do need a thriving sector and a, a cultural and creative sector and what does that mean in terms of a sustainability piece and then the other side is the sustainability of the future of who we are our next generations our planet and the role of culture in that in that ecosystem so one's more about value and that recognition and the other one is practical and tangible maybe i'll leave it at that thank you that's great thank you madalena um, Maria, you're joining us obviously from the British Council in Mexico um, and, and you are one of the, the, the leading people in terms of bringing together a whole variety of stakeholders, a whole variety of sectors, ideas um, around cultural cooperation. I wondered, my first question to you is, 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 is what can be done? What, is the, what are the most important things to do in order to really move to the next stage of cultural cooperation between uh, governing bodies, between cities? Uh, between international bodies and politics. Great. Thank you, Jonathan, and good morning to everyone from Mexico City. I first just wanted to thank Lord Parkinson for his engagement in the dialogues and Stephen Stenning as well, and of course, World Cities Culture Forum. Tita and Magdalena, it's a true honor to be here, um, just like having a, a chat with you. So thank you for that. Um, Jonathan, and your question, I think there is so much that still needs to be done. Um, at the British Council, we work in more than 90 countries uh, through you know, building sustainable culture and creative economies, making sure that our programs are engaged with local communities and making sure that everything we do is in partnership. You no know, one of the strengths we have is working in partnership. And that's exactly what we wanna you know, hone here and make sure that we gather all the people and diverse, diverse voices to obviously catapult into Mundia Kurt, as Magdalena said, this is a huge moment, not only for uh, culture policy, but, you know, for overall policymakers, uh, overall, you know, how do we think about not cultural policy in a silo, but actually culture in the hearts of other public policies? What can we learn from culture to insert them in, you know, educational, health, uh, political, 
economic policies. And I think culture is a great master and a lot, it has a lot to teach. Now, in terms of what can we do, uh, what can we still do, what we feel, what I feel, there's still a gap. There's a very big missing middle between the bigger and more grand narratives in, in the sense of the bigger cultural policies, international cooperation, the 2030 agenda in terms of uh, the role of culture, missing the missing link for development, etc. And the micro narratives where actually the more strategic work is getting done. <coughs> This means like all the grassroots organizations, all the artists, all the cultural managers that are by themselves organizing and as Tita said, no, working on the, not in the extractive, but in the constructive uh, sense of the word instead of, you know, how do we build, how do we create instead of extract? I think those, the bigger narratives as well as the micro, uh, micro efforts, which is basically what is building the culture we have and in our past and towards our future, there's a missing middle between that. And that missing middle is policy. That missing middle is getting the message across into the policy makers and making sure that those are bridged together, you know, making sure that they work together and they understand how do these two, you know, let's say opposites in terms of, you know, the bigger institutions plus the grassroots work are, you know, are, uh, how do we capitalize on that? How do we make sure we understand the impact that culture has and how do we, you know, narrate the evidence and how do we narrate the impact and how do we work with those decision makers to make sure that we are understanding and we are building a shared purpose. So I think, you know, there's a lot to do in terms of policy and there's a lot of lessons learned in terms of, as Magdalena said, the value chain and obviously the impact that culture does because we need to recognize and this we need to advocate and make the case that culture is our common ground of humanity. So if we don't recognize, you know, the culture and where we are in terms of what makes, what creates our identities, how we signify our world, how we understand each other as humanity, we are not going to be able to write a good policy if we don't understand that humanity and culture is what really, you know, builds us as, you know, the people on the planet, no? So I think there's a lot of work to do in terms of policy. That's fantastic, Maria. I think it's interesting. Um, I ran festivals for years and people would always say, oh, you'll have friends in high places. And then people would say, we support you on the ground. And, and the truth is, it was the middle places exactly. that you needed. It was it was absolutely that linking ground. Um, now, we have um, a, a short video from Johannes Ebert, who is going to speak to us now. He is Secretary General and Chairman of the Board of the Goethe Institute. Um, and he's joining us through video. Dear colleagues, dear friends, culture is important. This is no question. Culture, and I mean the arts and culture in a broader sense, is essential for the cohesion and the, and the development of societies. In Germany, in my country, culture is highly recognized as a contributing factor to national and local policies. In fact, the measures taken by the German government to support the cultural scene during the pandemic emphasize the importance of arts and culture as strong pillars of our civil society. And also beyond that, we have seen that culture has the ability to create mutual understanding and common ground within our societies, but also if you have a look at cultural exchange worldwide between societies on a global level. I believe that culture and the arts should always be free and that freedom of expression within culture should be independent from the governmental level. Also, governments play a very important role in supporting the cultural sector. It is important to create this framework in which the arts can thrive. Culture is a field in which the really difficult questions of our societies can be addressed. Different perspectives of values and of the common understanding of living together can be discussed within the framework of culture. And of course, cultural exchange brings new perspectives, experiments, new visions of our future. And I think this is very important in the time that we, that we live now together with big challenging questions like climate change, like migration, like different crises that we live in the world. When we talk about the development of societies, I think creative industries play a very important role. They, on one hand, improve the framework for culture. 
On the other hand, they create a sustainable contribution to national economies. We are currently facing many different forms of crises, which also have an economic impact. Budgets of states are getting smaller. But in my opinion, it is absolutely necessary that we make sure not to alienate cultural actors through harsh financial cutbacks, as their work has a long-lasting effect and contributes to social cohesion in a unique way. Culture and the arts form the pluralistic, intricate and viable network that our societies so highly depend on, nationally but also in a global context. So I think it is very important for our future to give the arts, to give culture, the resources that it needs to continue and to form perspectives for our future. Thank you, uh, thank you, Hannes, for that. That was superb. Um, back to the panel. I have a question uh, for Tita, which is, in your experience, uh, maybe in Indonesia, but also you work around the world, can you think of an example of a project or a moment that has seen a breakthrough, where something that's happened that has has, has seen that beginning of the shift from the extractive uh, to the uh, intersecting economy, uh, and, and that's caught the imagination in a way that you that we all we all look for all the time um yeah it's always inspiring to see how community works for itself because uh well i, I read somewhere where, where where government doesn't work people will so they will find a way to express themselves and then uh to make it um legal in a way so uh we see creative economy as an ecosystem so you cannot just talk about the transaction or the money it makes but we also have to see the whole ecosystem that includes the uh, human beings you have to see the capability but you also have to make sure about the access and equality will be an issue there as well so if you work on culture you work on especially people who still have uh, indigenous culture in themselves and traditional people who maybe don't have the same standard of say wealth as people who live in the city when we have to respect that and usually uh, it end up if we we do them uh, we do the uh, expression of them it it can be just an exploitation of uh, some uh, culture so that's where we should uh, be careful that's why in the one of the policy recommendations that we made uh, we mentioned that there is a need of in, an intermediary between the government and who makes policy and authorities and uh, people who are uh, usually at the uh, uh, practical level, uh, either workers or indigenous people or uh, underprivileged people and so on, um, so that uh, they can match between the top-down uh, initiatives and the bottom-up as well. Uh, examples, I maybe can think of uh, some, but then uh, that the one that really works, um, I don't know now, but <laughs> but I think uh, well, from, from the nearest uh, of experience, I think um, urban people uh, urban people in urban area like bandung uh, students who are uh, really well bandung is made of uh, bandung is a city of three million people but then it has hundred and something universities so those uh, who makes uh, maybe you can call it vandalism but it's a vandalism for a greater good because we just do things we just create prototypes physical prototypes of how the cities can be and then the government and the people can uh, experience how it feels to have, for example, a proper uh, park or a proper uh, a zebra crossing and so on. So simple things, but I've, for some uh, countries or some cities, they don't even have that. So we have to create that so government and people can experience it. That's interesting. Uh, thank you. And uh, Madalena, you, you talked about being on Bunurong land uh, in the Eastern Kulin Nation, which I, I know well because I lived there until exactly on that land until two years ago. So I uh, spent a lot of time with the uh, with the Eastern Kulin nations, and um, Tita talks about indigenous people. But taking indigenous to mean both, uh, obviously, people who've been on the land for forty thousand years, and also people who who live in mountains or countrysides who don't live in cities. What is the role of cities, in your mind, uh, with a view to how how it can unlock that energy from 
a variety of communities, not just those who live within it? How can cities represent an entire nation? Um, certainly. Well, they are, they play such a fundamental role. Um, uh, cities tend to be, or councils, local councils, municipalities tend to be so well connected to their, to their community and um, the sense of working together that sometimes um, at a national level where if it generally works in, um, it, it's a harder, a lot harder to, to sort of get to. Um, certainly in the um, community environment where I am and, in, and even in from my own country in uh, Chile, um, municipalities play a really critical role, particularly where, um, and you did also touched on this sort of, um, this urban notion. And one of the many barriers and challenges um, are around this sort of notion of um, decentralization and say it in Spanish, deconcentration in a way, because it's not only centralized decision-making, but it's also centralized approach and sort of um, congregating. So I guess it's the role of local council cities is so critical to ensure that there are opportunities to create that sort of local and support that local context, both indigenous and non-indigenous. So I cannot stress enough that we have to work uh, across the different government levels and across the different communities to make sure that we're not thinking of just a one size fits all. And I also stress that equity agenda that cannot be, I mean, I think that again, without trying to, you know, bring up the pandemic over and over again, it did actually remind us of a lot of the fault lines that we already have in our societies. And the the gaps have just gotten so much bigger. And I think there's a really interesting opportunity, particularly looking at community led initiatives, local initiatives, First Nations in, in, initiatives through an alternative model, alternative eyes that really have culture at the heart of it. Um, to actually um, affect some serious change that needs to happen. That's that's a really great point and really interesting. And uh, let's stay with that for one moment. I agree with you. We don't want to spend uh, the whole day talking about uh, the repercussions of the pandemic. But I would like to ask our audience uh, who are who are watching in their offices at home uh, in an internet cafe, wherever people watch things nowadays, anywhere it can be. What do you think has been the biggest repercussion of the pandemic? in the cultural sector globally. So return to Slido, if you would. Go to the polls section of Slido from the Q&A section, which, by the way, the Q&A section is filling up nicely. If you please continue with that. You have multiple choice here, but um, I'd love people to just comment on what they think uh, are the biggest repercussions of the pandemic in the cultural sector globally. Uh, the, the options are uh, weakened traditional revenue streams and funding, disruption to jobs and livelihoods, impact on grassroots and community infrastructure, increased at-home participation in activities, and negative impact on diversity and access. You can, you can vote for these in either Spanish or English. The vote goes to the same place um, because it's just statistics. And statistics, no, no language bounds, apparently, it says here on this piece of paper that I just made up. Please vote on Slido. Tell us what you think. What are the key things? I'm going to do it myself. Excellent. Oh, I'm winning. Um, good. Uh, any more thoughts on that? Otherwise, um, while you do that and continue with that, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Maria, a, a question for you. Uh, we Obviously, it's, it's been uh, a long time since Monday Occult uh, in 1982 really focused on a lot of these issues. Um, and uh, it, it truly mentioned the importance of cultural uh, orientated public policies. What in your mind has changed since 1982. Wow. Well, we have a full on new generation of people in the world who are turning 40 in just a while. Um, and so many things have changed now, even though we still remain those definitions of culture that were once defined in the Mondiac in 1982, which was such a paramount event to start naming the concepts that were once not names that they you know in, in the past i think that was really important that also you know hints that the idea that we need to as steve standing said in the in right in the beginning we need to rethink if these concepts still represent us you know what has changed under you know a, a full generation that i i i wasn't even alive when monday could happen in the, in the first 
instance. No, so we have a new generation, a new way of thinking, and of course we have you know the digital, obviously the digital revolution that has come and impacted, obviously our world. Even though the culture and creative industries have been studied and named since you know, uh, the school of Frankfurt back in the 19th century, we still, you know, we still, uh, this, this new, you know, understanding of the creative and cultural industries definitely has been during the last 20 years. No, it, it has been since then. So, so many things have happened. And one of the things like going back to the, to the question about, um, you know, challenges during the pandemic, I think we also need to mention about access, right? So, and mentioning access, speaking about access is speaking about cultural rights. And we need to obviously put on the table that culture is a universal human right and the access to culture needs to be secured by government. And we need to be able to access culture and to shape culture, to participate in, in culture and to enjoy culture, no? So there is so much that obviously has happened, but at the same time, we still need to defend what we needed to defend in 1982. We still, 40 years later, we haven't made the point across of the importance of culture, just like Magdalena started, no? We, it, it, it's it's kind of unbelievable that 40 years after first Mondia Cult in Mexico, we still need to defend this. We still need to make the case for it. We still need to advocate. Obviously, culture now is such a myriad of, you know, different nuances. And what I think and where I would like to, to take this is that culture usually is seen as a nostalgia, no? Usually culture is seen as a past, no? It's seen only as our heritage, only as our predecessors. How do we think of culture in the future? How do we take all these learnings and place them in the future? What elements does culture give us to understand the past and actually thrive towards the future and bring the next generation of you know, 40 year olds in, in the future to make sure that we, we did our work, no, make sure that we, we didn't pass 40 years without making the case for culture. That's great. I think, I think it's fair to say that it's not 40 years, it's arguably 400. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's difficult since the Medici's to say that anyone's really made a, a great case uh, for arts or culture in a country. Uh, and yet, if you look at the number of people visiting what the Medici supported in Italy or what was supported in uh, uh, around the world. I mean, people don't visit cities uh, to see the banks, do they? Um, and so, uh, but you're right, we absolutely need to make that case. Now, 64% of people who voted in the last Slido poll um, talked about the impact on jobs being the most significant element. And I, I wondered, and this is open to all of the panel members, um, what has been the impact on jobs and what what are the policies we need to do now to really move things forward and to make the point in uh, the next two months to uh, to the ministers about jobs and culture and, uh, and and the way that culture and creativity can impact on jobs globally and i will pick someone if i need to but otherwise i'm just going to look at you all maybe uh, i, just, I can just take it from there. Um, I think this is a wider conversation than just the jobs in the culture. I think it goes back to local um, national economies, no, and, and uh, to those, you know, um, let's say inequalities that we have. I think it's also really important to address in this panel and, and put it out there, you know, the especially looking into Global South, you know, the, the importance and the stakes that we have in terms of informal economy. No, when we have informal economy, when we have fragmented economies, when we when we have a, a chain values that don't really sustain themselves, then any type of event, not only a huge pandemic like we had, they are risk. And again, uh, this risk, this risk, this risk is obviously what impacts, no, making sure that people that were really going to make a difference in our ecosystem, in our world, decide not to do it because it's too risky for them. And we're missing a lot of, we're missing a lot of valuable assets that could have, you know, made a difference in the world if we don't have stronger, not only cultural economies, not only creative industries, but stronger economies as a whole that really value the importance of sustaining, you know, the practices of culture and creativity. So of course they're interlinked and of course, uh, we have, you know, a fragile economy uh, in terms of culture and creative industries. But then again, we need to make the case to these policymakers that it goes back to a more systemic, you know, uh, difficulty or inequality in terms of how do we value, you know, what what these 
creative industries and cultural practices bring. And then we have to make the case for them. No? And it's yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm interested in 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 both in both the angle of how we make the argument about the the importance of the cultural sector and uh, the value of it and the and the increased um, centrality of it. I mean, uh, to take Australia, Madalena, for an example, uh, obviously more people work uh, in uh, the cultural sector than work in mining or agriculture, and uh, and and so actually it's a significant sector. But my question next is is how do we also make the point that it's the answer to these problems? What we do is the way of dealing with climate change, the way of dealing with a pandemic, the way of dealing with global inequality, global north, global south. How do we, how do we make the arts and culture, how do we make it the absolute core central answer that the ministers need in order to just simply give them the resolution they want? Well, <laughs> very big question. But but if I was to link your initial uh, question around um, uh, the job, uh, jobs and livelihoods and lives, and then connected to that bigger piece, how we make the ministers listen, we need a we need a thriving cultural and creative sector. And in order for us to have one, we need for for its workers to have appropriate social and economic conditions, and that is connected to a freedom piece. It's actually the freedom. It, it is about artistic freedom. It is about freedom of artistic expression. Because if you're negating the opportunities for people to enter this space as a workforce, then you're actually affecting their, you know, impacting on their freedom, on their ability. We need sustainable models. We need to understand that it's that it is a workforce and that it does deserve social safety net, and that it does require a level of formality with the flexibility to understand the natural and the um, idiosyncrasies of the cultural sector. But that is a fundamental piece that has gotten us in this mess in the pandemic. We weren't considered a formal sector and particularly for all the people that are in atypical jobs as defined by the ILO or in that informality or that gig economy. So what happened in between people left the cultural sector there's this really interesting statistic of 20 percent of the music industry or you know people in the music industry in sweden left and retrained to go elsewhere now i don't know how accurate that is today but at the time in the middle of the pandemic for a very wealthy country like sweden to lose 20 percent of its music industry that's huge so if a country like that if you go into countries in the global south the scales are phenomenal, what is happening in India, what is happening in different parts of Africa and Sub-Sahara. So the sector needs to be um, recognised and that is a really key part of where policy work needs to go in terms of a really practical aspect. And I think recognition goes hand in hand with this notion of value because we don't question the importance of a scientist in, the, in terms of and I know it's totally different, but there are symbolic value as well into this worker, but we do sometimes forget the worker side of it that is integral for there to be um, dynamism and further development. Anyway, I could speak for hours. I, 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 I actually don't think there's a difference between the arts sector and either science or medicine. I think they both mm. uh, they both do the same job. They go in. I also, if you just said it was 25% of the music industry in, in Sweden, I would have suspected it was it was it was something to do with ABBA. Um, but I apologise <laughs> now to the people of Sweden for making a cliche joke. Jagelski um, Day, you know I love you. Uh, now, uh, on that matter though, uh, Tita, my question is is. Can you give us an example? We're talking now about cross-sector collaboration. We're talking about the link between culture and creativity and, for example, the way that health has repositioned itself or the way sports has repositioned itself or the way that science has repositioned itself insofar as it's, it's, it's just understood that the first, the first dose of any medicine costs billions and then the next dose costs pence, but that the, the, the experimentation is everything. Uh, and that's how culture should be. Can you think of an example, Tita, or have you any observation about how we can learn from other sectors um, in, in our approach to changing hearts and minds? Yeah, uh, the challenge is actually, it remains the same, that you cannot measure culture in a way you measure, for example, medicine or technology engineering, uh, which are very tangible. But then for culture, how would you because um, even uh, there are no standardized uh, fee, for example, for dancers or for uh, music 
uh, musicians or something, especially if they're in an informal sector, if they're working on festivals or on carnivals and so on, uh, they don't have um, a standard fee and so on. So that's, that's where the informality is uh, here, uh, especially in the global south and Indonesia especially, we realize that um, there are two kinds of entrepreneurship. One is the one that is really going to be entrepreneurs. Uh, usually they are the ones in uh, creative sectors as well. But the other one is uh, they don't have any other choice but selling what they can do, which is mostly the traditional values or uh, skills that they have. So these kind of people are usually the ones that rely mostly on the social capital of their community. And that really happens a lot. And if uh, according to the say uh, global standard that, hey, you're living under the uh, wealth uh, standard, for example, they don't think they, they are. So we live just fine like this. So how would you measure people who are already satisfied with their have? And uh, that's, a, that's a challenge. So how would you measure that? So that's why we are offering this kind of index to see um, uh, governments always, always need data. And data is important because that's uh, a weapon to uh, have an argument over something, including budget, including facilities, and so on. It's to um, uh, what's, what's to com compensate if they, they are given so and so uh, facilities. Um, I think that, that this, this conversation can go around and around, and it has to, uh, different uh, uh, contexts in different countries as well. Uh, like uh, previously said, there's no one size fits all policy and so on, but at least if we can recognize uh, the value of culture. Uh, and also they start talking also about the value of very intangible things like this digital uh, aesthetic assets and so on. So uh, this, this is the things that we are, we are facing now and in the future because uh, things are already going very fast in the digital world and also in the, uh, in the other sense that uh, we discussed. But then the policy should be able to handle that in a way. Yeah, that's right. And so, and so, in terms of the uh, what we're putting now to the ministers in uh, Mexico City in a, in a month or so's time, what would, if you had a single recommendation that would begin to fit this gap, this policy gap, this clear mismatch between the work that's being done on the ground and the and the and the very high level desires both to support culture and also to use culture as a, a means for good if you had one recommendation and this question to all three panelists what would your single first recommendation be to the ministers in mexico and I, i'm going to i'm going to put that to um to maria first if i may sure well, one, I don't think it, we can have one, only one, but in terms of what, what Tita was saying, I think a good first approach, and this is something that we've done a quite bit of research in the British Council through the missing pillar research and talks would be to, if we can't just do, you know, clear indicators or KPIs to one size fits all, we can start using common language. And we, one of the one of the recommendations would be to adopt the language of the SDGs. So how can, you know, how can these cultural practitioners, whether they're grassroots, whether they're policymakers, start, you know, inserting our actions into a global agenda of, you know, sustainable development? How can we make our voices and our value um, be seen and recognized? Then um, I also think it's important to obviously, you know, work with local governments and federal governments to build capacities within policymakers because sometimes we need to understand that um, cultural agendas come to to policymakers that don't necessarily have all the tools and who have different levels of understanding about these you know this this let's say a you know complicated or conceptual theme as culture policy, no? So we work with them and we, we we really make sure that because the evidence is there, we have tons of reports, you know, big government bodies are making reports. You know, there are many institutions, multilaterals making re reports and sharing the evidence. But those reports don't really resonate all the time because obviously versus the budget, let's say in health and health crisis versus in culture, you know, the priorities are very different. But if we start to building that shared purpose or if we start to build that capacity in, in everything, you know, in cultural practitioners, in students, in higher education institutions, 
since they want to start developing in the cultural ecosystem and we start to build those capacities then you know little by little we can start you know making making the, the, that change and bridging this this gap or this missing middle between the larger narratives and the smaller actions that create the culture great thank you madalena what what, what would be your I mean, I, obviously, there, there's not going to be one recommendation. There will be many, but, uh, but, but if you had to fight for one, what, what would be the one that you would push straight towards? Um, I would say avoid working in silos because I think that's what has gotten us in the troubles that we're in. And that can be interpreted in a whole range of ways, which means um, you must work across portfolio. You need to work with your other ministries. And that doesn't, that doesn't say that your, the cultural budget has to diminish, not at all. In fact, it should be larger, but it does mean that there is an opportunity to embed culture in other portfolios that, that can be delivered through other lens. And, um, and I guess picking up on what um, the Secretary General from the Goethe Institute was saying about this, the importance of, of the arts to also be free. So I guess it's not about artists becoming or, or you know taking on necessarily other roles, um, but um, allowing that space to breathe so that culture can be transformative, can be involved in other portfolios, while at the same time supporting and thriving um, and strengthening the actual cultural ecosystem um, through also the cultural portfolio. That also translates in terms of how we um, think about culture and and I also pick up on that the notion of it shouldn't be transactional it should be much more of a um, relationship um, and um, that piece around cultural rights is really absolutely critical um, I would also emphasize that you know not working in silos does mean working with your uh, you know Ministry of uh, Labor you know uh, to ensure that as I strongly advocated before that there is a strengthened sector. Um, so I guess it's looking at all the different areas of public policy and ensuring that um, it is embedded. And in that sense, I would connect that to the SDGs by saying that we do need a language change, but I guess I'm not sure whether it's so much the sector or civil society needs to learn the language. I think the, Uni the United Nations needs to change the language um, because we are going to, we can hope for better futures if together we are thinking about our sustainable futures and the role of people, the role of communities is essential. And then again, that goes back to the silos of public policy and any type of policy cannot be done um, through closed doors. Fabulous. And, and Tita, the same question to you. What, what would be your, what would be the top of your shopping list for uh, recommendations to uh, ministers from around the world? Magdalena and Maria already said, uh, yeah, things that I wanted to say. So maybe just one thing left about the, uh, prioritizing access to those who don't have such uh, or enough uh, um, resources to do so. Couldn't agree more. I, I'm going to read a few comments uh, from uh, Slido that we've had. Uh, do the arts need to get better at business speak, KPIs, um, or should they fight their own corner? Um, or, uh, the question I think there is, is, is should we be learning the language of others or should we be teaching the language of uh, of creativity and and, the, and almost the soft skills. Um, should we be getting employers to uh, focus more on their application processes and employment practices, which is Madalena's point? Absolutely. Um, creatives of the world unite. I think well, that's what we're doing right now. And um, we should do that a bit later as well, because um, actually these conversations are everything. Because we all, even if, even if we're all in the same sector, we still live in geographical silos and we believe our problems are unique um how how do we ah here's a question uh, culture and creativity forming one of the 12 outcomes um this is a question about sdgs should should and it comes we always have this conversation should there be a culture sdg should there be a sustainable development goal built around culture itself or is culture cross-cutting and does it affect all of the 28 sustainable development goals and that's a question to anybody who wishes to jump in onto the into the infamous SDG culture debate and question, the single question. Madalena. All right, I'll do it, I'll do it. Um, it's sort of been a bit of a bumpy ride. 
Um, but where I'm landing at the moment is that I would say yes to both. And why? Because of the asymmetries in the world that uh, having a, a, a goal for culture, particularly in the developing world, um, members have told us this directly, gives them the, the, the power, the agency then to advocate in a national context, to ensure that at the national development stages of uh, uh, national planning, national strategy, that culture can be there. It's a very, very strong argument if it's um, uh, 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 within the uh, SDGs. But the danger of that is that you disconnect from everything that I've just said in terms of operating in a silo. And I think that's where what should happen that hasn't happened yet is to have clear indicators and changing the language and the flexibility and the opportunities around how you can achieve other sustainable development goals, such as you know, addressing the climate crisis, poverty, uh, gender parity, all of those through the lens of culture. So I wouldn't want there to be either or. I think it's a really incredible opportunity for both. Fantastic. Do Maria or Tito, do you want to add anything to that as regards specifically sustainable development goals? I think that was a great answer. And I think it's not, yeah, it's not either or. It's, it's both. I do think that if it's a transversal element, we need to articulate it better and we need to obviously make it more visible. No, because whether it's an it's a single silo or whether it's an in it's a it's a transversal cross cutting theme, we need to make it louder. We need to be more clear on 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 you know on the sub on let's say the the targets no it reaches no so either or we just need to advocate more for that yeah. Great, Tita, do you have a thought? Yeah, uh, practically yeah I agree. But then uh, as as with our governments as well, uh, if it's not uh, written or spoken up uh, explicitly, then they they would think it's it's not there. So why would we care? So some people think like that. So some so maybe it is yes there because uh, then we have a strong support that it should be uh, put attention to. Uh, while now of course it's transversal, but it's shy. So <laughs> they don't think about it uh, as important as the rest. And it's, uh, there's an interesting comment on Slido here as well about um, about whether culture is perceived as a luxury in um, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, you'll be very pleased to hear. Uh, you should stay tuned for Pierre Luigi Sacco uh, uh, in the third session today, who talks extensively about um, well, often talk. I don't know if he will today, but I'll ask him about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the fact that culture actually is not about self-actualization is not just about top of the hierarchy it's fundamentally about survival it's about life expectancy it's about changing uh, the world maria uh, could i could i go back to you and ask from you again from your british council point of view what what are we what do we still need to think about in this conversation we have about um, 8 minutes left could you offer some observations on 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 where we are and where you think we're going yes um, I think it's a very exciting moment. I think we're really seeing, um, you know, quite a different view and array of, you know, the, the diversity that culture brings. I think we should all be very excited for Mondial Curs. I know the government of Mexico is doing a, a, a great job in making sure that, you know, themes are articulated into, you know, the differences in, in policies especially looking at indigenous people, indigenous needs, obviously looking into outside of the cities. I think that is a paramount topic and that's something that has also changed from 1982, no? making sure that we understand the diversity of our cultural sector. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've obviously, you know, gone over through a huge, you know, a range of maybe just in a very, um, let's say, quick way because we can't go we can't speak for for ages on this and we still have three two more panels to go today so um i think you know we should all be looking into this is a very important moment and make sure that we you know make the case no whether it's from our own positions and in institutions whether it's our own you know um you know position as an artist or as a as a as a you know, an independent manager, I think, you know, it's important to to don't give up on this. I think, you know, culture is 
culture brings hope and optimism. And I think it's important to not give up on optimism, especially in the world we're living now, no? So it is a vehicle for, for wellness. It, it is a vehicle for, you know, um, health and happiness. And we definitely need that in these times of crisis, no? So I think it's important that we we stay on this. We, you know, keep fighting for positioning culture in the heart of not only cultural policy per se, but other policies. Now, what can we learn? What can we teach? So I think we're looking at a very exciting moment and I'm very excited to be part of the cultural sector in 2022. Great, um, that's fantastic. I, I, I agree with you entirely. I think we do need to think, uh, another question is about who are the intermediaries and how can they best fill those gaps? Um, actually, we do have time for that one question. Uh, who, who, are the, who are best placed? Is it at a ministerial global level? Is it? At a city leadership level, is it? Uh, who are those? Who, who are the people who should be making this case in the strongest possible way? Obviously, we can only define what we ourselves should do because we're the people in the room at this moment. But who should be making that argument? Uh, if I may, yes. well, uh, organizations that have at the, for example, national level, but they have the consensus of uh, all the actors, whether they're at the bottom or they're the authorities, but they are independent in a way that they don't change every five years or every every time the government changes. So they're they're always there. So their uh, interest is not the politics or not the how can I get elected next or how, where else can I get the budget if not from the public money and so on. But those who are really in the in the sectors and um, well truly uh, doing what what they do. Um, for expression, for uh, income, uh, for all. So uh, th this goes to where we go next, because then um, uh, we, we define that uh, uh, in the stakeholders of such creative economy and so on, uh, they also, this, uh, you mentioned about intermediary. We also have the six, uh, this is in the journal of uh, ADBI, just came out and will be launched uh, in August during T20. Uh, it's called Creative Economy 2030. So we, we mentioned about the sixth helix. So there are pentahelix first, there are five helix, there's government, community, business, and so on. So we argue that uh, creative economic, uh, cultural and creative industries are the sector, are, is the sector that provide uh, inclusive jobs in the future. So the sixth helix is the, the aggregator. We can actually connect this as well. Uh, be the intermediary, whether they are from, um, um, anything so uh, um, community uh, groups or anything that uh, that ha that can be um, I don't know, is it English um, can be a push uh, factor for the whoever the authority is thank you Jonathan great thank you Tita uh, anybody else got any examples of who were not who were really not pulling in at the moment who we need to be pulling in I think we need to ask ourselves who we're not talking to. And I, and, and I think that um, in the cultural sector, we tend to meet with those who we who think are like, and which is wonderful because we all agree, but we need to really think about why there are certain uh, groups, um, sectors, even people that have different visions. And I think that is a really important piece to kind of understand how we can work towards, um, yeah, a kind of a more inclusive. Um, and uh, I mean, in terms of the intermediaries, there are so many, it's really down to the, your context because an appropriate intermediary, for example, at a policy level or an implementation level might be your arts council, uh, your national arts council within your country, if there is one, or it may actually be the union, or it may actually be a community led uh, or, or a cultural leader, or so I think it's really looking at those that those, those that lead people in leadership role that can sort of um, that you can work with to support. I don't think we all, everybody in the sector and artists need to be policy experts, but I do need to create opportunities for that cross pollination to occur um, definitely. Um, Jonathan, do you mind if I do a very quick plug-in, which is part of the Mondia call? Very quick, very quick. Very, very quick. Um, if people go to our website, the ifica.org, where the Ministry of Culture of Mexico has asked us to organize something called Open Mic, 
and we're doing a report to hand over to them and everybody's invited to submit their ideas and obviously we'd love the British Council's involvement. Great. But, um, just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Madalena. It's fascinating. Great, great, great conversation. Uh, some of the things I really take away strongly uh, from this conversation um, are about getting across silos and, and getting out of silos. Also about finding out who are our best champions because sometimes uh, I look at some uh, an area like sport and um, and they're very smart. They play Michael Jordan when they want to talk about how it's elite and extraordinary. And then they play their local uh, football team when they want to talk about community engagement. They play uh, the people whose lives it's changed through health and well-being when they want to talk about uh, its impact. So how can we get the best, uh, to use a sporting metaphor, players on the pitch to do this? And uh, Mondia Cult is a great opportunity uh, to do that. It's a great opportunity to really put forward some strong statements to ministers from around the world in order to to establish the importance of creativity all there is to say now is thank you to our panelists to tita larizati to madalena moreno Mujica, um to maria garcia holly to our uh, our great uh, people who, who videoed in johannes ebert uh, to stephen stenning for joining us and lord parkinson uh, we have two more sessions today the third one is um, very much about uh, transitional change and how we can uh, inform everything. The second one looks strongly at sustainable development goals, uh, and they're all going to be absolute crackers. Uh, so please join us for those. The next session starts at 11 o'clock CDT, Mexico time, 5 o'clock uh, British summer time in London, and uh, 6 o'clock in Europe. So please join us for those. In the meantime, thank you all. Thank you to the British Council. Thank you to Mondi Cult. Thank you to the World Cities Culture Forum for an absolutely fabulous opportunity. Thank you.
guess. Hold on.
everyone. Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from today. My name is Ojamal Chai, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this second session in the series of high level dialogues that have been organized by the British Council in partnership with World Cities Cultural Forum. This panel that you're dialing into now is titled Culture at the Heart of Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. And if you've joined, um, if you dialed in earlier, you will know that this is the second of three panels that are happening today from, with speakers from around the world representing um, virtually all of the continents. As you probably already know, these sessions are in the lead up to Mondial Cult 2022, UNESCO's World Conference on Cultural Policies and Sustainable Development. Mondial Cult 2022 is taking uh, place in Mexico in September, where ministers of culture from around the world will gather. Today's sessions is to hear from top professionals from around the world on key matters and models affecting culture and its representation within policy and planning, and to inform the recommendations that will be made to UNESCO um, in this regard. For this panel, um, I'm delighted that we have a, a wonderful panel that I will introduce shortly from around the world, but also different people joining us from around the world, um, including from Mexico, from the United Kingdom, from South Africa, and from Nigeria, where I'm dialing in from today. Thank you all for joining. We want to make this session as interactive as possible. And so in addition to the discussion with our panel, we'll be having a number of polls on Slido. I think many of you will have already downloaded Slido, but if you haven't, please go to slido.com because there will be lots of questions um, and polls um, on Slido. If you haven't downloaded Slido already, the code is 92593330. I'll take it again, slido.com 92593330. That's where we will be taking questions and that's where the polls that we will do in this session will be. Um, we're going to jump straight into it and I'll give you uh, by way of background, and say that although culture can be seen as the missing pillar in development policy, our heritage, our living cultures, and our creative economy are at the heart of many societal, economic, and environmental challenges. Culture can be, at the same time, the cause of the issues we're seeing and suffer the effects, but can also be part of the solution. So this session is looking at what cultural approaches can be used to address the SDGs. We're going to be answering the question, how can the SDGs support culture as a public good globally? And what does this mean? In what ways can we see the SDGs as a framework for cultural activity, be it from a sectoral point of view or from a community perspective? Joining me to discuss this important topic are uh, a distinguished panel, and I'm just going to introduce them very briefly. We've got Frances Rudgard, who's from Living Arts International. If you give them a virtual round of applause for me, as I call their names. Um, we've also got Enrique Avogadro, who's from the Ministry of Culture in Buenos Aires in Argentina. We've got Emmanuel Robert, who's from UNESCO. We've got Jonathan Tangi Tiong, who's from the ASEAN Secretariat. We've got Rudo Yangulu Mungofa, who's from Stimulus Africa Foundation in Zimbabwe. And we've got Sandra Chege from the British Council, who's dialing in from Kenya today. So a truly global panel from around the world. Thank you all panelists for making the time. I can't wait to get stuck in with the questions um, for today. But before we do that, We'd just like to hear from our audience. And so we've got a Slido poll. And so if I can just ask people to head over to Slido 
you will probably be able to see on your screen right about now a QR code as well that you can also scan to get on the page where the poll is. Or you can go to slido.com on your phone with the code 9259330. So the question that we've got for you is, do you currently place the SDGs at the heart of the work that you do? And the options are yes, no, sometimes, hmm, not sure. So if you can head over to Slido and vote, we will look out for what you're saying on Slido before we come to the panelists to begin the session. So I'll just pause for a few seconds. Okay. I, I can see that you lot are being very honest. The majority of people are saying um, sometimes and between sometimes and no, that's the majority. And then there's a few not sure's. And then at the moment is 25% saying yes, they currently place the SDGs at the heart of the work they do. Hopefully today's session will give you some inspiring examples of how you can actually um, put the SDGs at the heart of your work. So thank you for voting. We'll come back to Slido later in the session for, uh, for other polls, as well as for questions and comments from the audience. Now I'll come back to you, distinguished panel. We have asked you to dig deep and think about your best example of what happens when we put culture at the heart of the um, SDGs. And so I'm going to go around the panel in turn and ask you to please share with us uh, these examples that you have. I'm going to go with you first, Francis, if that's OK, to tell us about the best example you've got, or at least a good example yeah. that you've got <laughs> of <laughs> culture at the heart of the SDGs. Over to you, Francis. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so the example I'm going to share, I think a slide will come up shortly so you can see some pictures while I'm talking. But the example I'm going to share is a project that was implemented by one of the fellows of Mekong Cultural Hub. His name's Tanapon Yindi, and he's a theatre artist from Northeast Thailand. Um, I've picked up this micro example because I think it shows really well the positive outcomes of integrating cultural practices and knowledge into work related to SDGs. And I think it's also a good example of how artists and cultural workers can thoughtfully approach development related actions. So the aim of the project that he led was to raise awareness of water management issues in a particular village based around its river. So the artists started the project by preparing with some field work. Uh, they researched local livelihoods, different experiences and situations with water in the community. Uh, from there, they learned also about local wisdom and traditional relationships that people have with water and nature. And also through the mapping, they defined a bit more precisely who they wanted to work with in the community. So then they decided to focus on young people and had an open call uh, for young people from the local area to take part. Um, so as they started the project they had a kind of triangle structure among the people involved so there were three groups of stakeholders themselves the artist organizers the community which was the young people and then very importantly they also included into that uh, team for the the project uh, local technical experts with knowledge on uh, environment and water protection so the first activity of the project was to walk uh, to do a walk together to trace the river to see how it flows and passes through the forest into the community so the walk was led by the local guide and by the water and environment experts so artists and villagers uh, came to understand more about how nature's a system and how the different parts of that uh, ecosystem connect and mutually influence each other. Um, participants could also see in kind of hands-on experience how the river could be polluted or conversely how it could be well protected and thinking about a concept of upstream downstream they identified ways that their livelihoods influence the environment around that river but also talked about how the environment will in the future influence the community's livelihood if it's not taken care of. Also during the walk, they learned some scientific knowledge, but they participated in a traditional ritual uh, worshipping the water. Um, and that ritual, the inclusion of the ritual was really important because it established the existing connection that's there between local tradition and environmental protection. Um, 
And finally, I'd like to see the project was a workshop where seniors from the community taught young people how to collect wild honey, which was something the young people didn't know the, the seniors knew. Um, so, and then the, the young people with the artists developed some kind of creative design for honey products. So that collaboration also strengthened community connection and reinforced links between water, food and livelihoods in the village ecosystem. So I think it's a good project. The engaging the local water and environment specialists helped the artists sharpen their focus regarding the kind of awareness that they wanted to raise and how their project could contribute to the community. But taking a cultural approach to the project meant it had a deeper and wider impact than it would likely have had with only a presentation from, from scientists. So that's our little example from the Mekong region. Thank you. Thanks very much, Francis. I'll come back with um, uh, some follow on questions, but moving swiftly on, Enrique, do you want to go next with your example of what happens when we put culture at the heart of the SDGs? Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to share some um, local examples with you from Buenos Aires, Argentina in South America. Uh, I am Minister of Culture of our city and um, one of the SDG goals aims to promote the environment to generate prosperity in the communities. That's why one of the examples I wanted to share, I will share three very briefly, is called Buenos Aires International Production or Cash Rebate. And it's part of our wider scheme, scheme to promote cultural and creative industries in our city as a way to raise people out of poverty, get new jobs and um, access to our talent uh, as a way to um, increase creative production in our city. We launched this scheme, this scheme four or five months ago, uh, and it's uh, catered towards international productions. What we are trying to do is to uh, lure them, attract them to our city through uh, different incentive policies um, to uh, work with our local talent in different audiovisual productions that where Buenos Aires has great advantages in terms of talent, good weather, green spaces, architectural diversity, among many others. And what we are trying to do is position ourselves as one uh, a, a creative um, hub that can produce international uh, content for the whole world. That's uh, one of the examples I wanted to share, our cash rebate scheme. Um, but a second one, and I think much more relevant, is called Abasto Cultural Neighborhood. Abasto is a neighborhood in our city called Barrio Abasto that concentrates uh, the largest number of independent cultural spaces, venues in our city. We have more than, in, our, in the whole city, more than 500 cultural venues in terms of theaters, music venues, uh, galleries, small library, bookstores, and all. Uh, and this neighborhood has a very large number of them, including also uh, a large number of multicultural identity expressions uh, on a local and metropolitan scale. It's uh, also a neighborhood that has historically developed this kind of activities related in our case to tango and milongas. Carlos Gardel, one of our most famous singers, uh, used to sing about uh, the Abasto neighborhood. And what we've been doing is working together, not only with the cultural venues, but also with all the other cultural institutions, restaurants, bars, and uh, NGOs, and, and, and other institutions at the local level, bringing them uh, in a, uh, forward to a sort of uh, build together a, a whole conversation about the, the identity of the neighborhood, the future, of this neighborhood and the improvements that we can do in the public realm together with a particip participatory management model between multiple actors, uh, including, of course, government, but also, as I said, cultural spaces, neighborhood organizations and companies, strengthening in a way the, the social cohesion of the neighborhood and trying to imagine this neighborhood as the neighborhood of the in independent cultural scene but at the same time trying to bring everybody on board, which is not that easy taking into account the impact of gentrification, you know, in this kind of, of projects. Uh, we recently won an award, the uh, UCLG award uh, as, as the best cultural project uh, for last year. And we are very proud. We will be sharing this information 
in, in Mondia Cult uh, later in the year in, in, in Mexico. And the last but not least uh, is called Pase Cultural or Cultural Pass. Uh, and it's a scheme that we launched four years ago it's, and it's catered, directed, especially to socialize and culture, at, to bring culture, uh, to bring in to the cultural conversation to youngsters. Um, and it's basically a card that we provide to every student in, in our public schools. Uh, and in this card, we put real money, actual money. The thing is that this money, they can only use it in cultural activities, whatever they choose to do. They can buy books, they can go to the movies, to a theater, they can go to a museum or to a live concert. They're free to choose, and it's very important that they are the ones who are choosing what to do with this. Um, what we're trying to do is to expand access to culture in our city, get more people involved in the cultural conversation, especially uh, students uh, from less developed or less uh, yeah less developed neighborhood in our neighborhoods in our city and uh, we are bringing the whole private cultural private sector on board they are part of this scheme they provide uh, also discounts and other benefits and in a way we're building a, a huge social network with students in public schools that are relating themselves constantly with culture and we're not only providing money and discounts but also constantly new experiences within the program so we introduce them to artists we take them to um theaters and they end up talking to to actors or, or visiting museums it's a great scheme and and what we are aiming is to get every absolutely everybody on board in terms of being part of, of culture in a city where culture is at the cornerstone of our identity. Thank you very much. And it really, it's a pleasure to share our experience, but mainly learn from your experience. Thank you very much for that, Enrique. Um, and congratulations on the award. I'll now move to Emmanuel. And I'm sure you'll give us a slightly different perspective as UNESCO, um, being a global organization, will have um, quite a broad view of things, but can you share with us, Emmanuel, um, an example from your side of what happens when we put culture at the heart of the SDGs? Inviting UNESCO to take part in this uh, important dialogue. Um, if you agree, I will focus on an example at the multilateral level. As you say, I think it's it's uh, it's very interesting to have example at both the local and the and the global or regional level. Uh, you know that Mondiaco reflects a growing aspiration of countries to reinvest multilateral dialogue on culture. When you know that we are in a very volatile uh, global environment, so this is uh, increasingly critical. And this aspiration is expressed in many different contexts within the UN system, for example, within regional organizations such as the EU or African Union, but also within other economic and social fora, which are actually not very traditionally familiar with culture. And uh, in that spirit, I would like to share with you a story on the gradual inclusion of culture within the J20 discussions as a dedicated work stream. As you know, uh, the J20 is primarily an economic and financial uh, forum. And since the 2008 financial crisis, the scope of the J20 discussions was broadened to include other components of development, notably uh, education or social development, among others. But until recently, culture was not in the picture. Since 2020, culture stepped into the J20 discussions, and this process was also supported by, by UNESCO. And I, I must say that it's no coincidence that it happens now that this interest for culture uh, within the J20 unfolds in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we know that the cultural sector was hardly hit by the pandemic, but also it was uh, an accelerator for countries to acknowledge the power of culture for economic growth, for resilience, for well-being, and for a number of development outputs around the world. So this trajectory of culture within the J20 was gradually strengthened between 2020 and 2022, under the presidency of Saudi Arabia first, Italy, and this year, Indonesia. In 2020, Saudi Arabia hosted the first J20 ministerial meeting, which was a starting point. Then in 2021, 
this, uh, this effort amplified, Italy developed a very ambitious work stream on topics ranging from the role of culture for climate action to the linkages between culture and education. And this effort culminated in July 2021 with the Rome Declaration, which was approved by the J20 Ministers of Culture, and later in October 2021 with the inclusion of culture in the J20 Leaders Dec Declaration, which is the Heads of State. So this trajectory was pursued this year under the Presidency of Indonesia, and the focus is laid under the, the, at the request of Indonesia on the notion of culture for sustainable living, which as you see is quite broad in terms of conceptual approach. And the Global Recovery Fund for the Cultural Sector is also on the table. It was proposed by Indonesia and it's currently being discussed among the J20. So in a nutshell, this was my, my story and thank you very much for your attention. And a good story indeed. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, moving swiftly on, we're going to go to you now, Jonathan, to give us your example of culture at the heart of the SDGs. Me here in this dialogue. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to share three observations and examples on how today's challenges to sustainable development can benefit from the cross-cutting role that culture plays in supporting SDGs. Um, first, I would like to start by saying that we need to find ways to better link culture with the broader issues of development. I, I would say that uh, sectoral or silo sector approach won't work well anymore and it's becoming less relevant in today's context. For ASEAN, we being in a highly disaster prone region and given the climate emergency we are already in, we are in need uh, of greater coordination and dialogue between the sectors in disaster management and environment with that of the culture sector so that we could better protect and preserve all facets of cultural heritage. So one example uh, of what we do in ASEAN to address climate action through culture is really to unlock the value of uh, digital culture. Through digital culture, such as digitizing our cultural artifacts, we hope that it will help to also uh, form part of the solution to address the threat of cultural losses due to climate change and disasters. And we also think that um, involving cultural actors and incorporating creative forms in conversations on environmental issues may also resonate more widely with people into call to action. Second point I would like to make here is to offer the observation that many economic developments today may benefit from a culture-centric approach. Take, for example, the creative economy. A culture-centric creative economy can play a critical role in promoting inclusive development, especially gender equality, given that women employment in the creative and cultural sector stands at 57% globally. So in Southeast Asia, we are proactively developing a culture-centric approach toward promoting the ASEAN creative economy. A third and final point that I would like to make here is that through a greater concert of culture-centric efforts upstream, culture can step up to play an important role in advocating and advancing prevention to address the challenges that we face today in the world. In ASEAN, we have been consciously seeking to promote and develop a culture of prevention where we regard culture as a vector that works across a range of policy areas from gender equality to uh, poverty eradication. So I would like to conclude by saying that as we rethink and reimagine the role for culture, it is crucial to ensure that orientation is inclusive and people-centric and the discourse on the transversal nature of culture amplified the creative and curative role that it plays in and for sustainable development. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I really like what you're saying there about our people's centricity, if there's any such word. Um, but we'll move now to Rudo to give us your example of culture um, at the heart of the SDGs. Thank you, Joma, and good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, what I'd like to talk about, um, thinking about culture as being something that's quite dynamic, is 
how our prison culture can evolve to enable the SDGs um, to, to be fulfilled. And I looked at examples within the education sector and under SDG 4 and the opportunity for um, people, young people in particular, to get um, a holistic and full education, but also for education to be a continuous process that um, is embraced as a as a journey and the examples that i want to share the first being um, on a, a sort of a micro level in in my organization the work that we do is centered around entrepreneurship and we work quite a lot within the creative economy and trying to stimulate and foster a creative economy um, in southern africa but also ge generally trying to build those skills particularly in young people who have left um, the education sector without um, the requisite uh, skills or knowledge that they need to ensure their own livelihoods and one example um, is where we were able to co-create um, a program and implement a solution for 500 young rural women living in northern uh, Zimbabwe in an area called Mbire. Um, these young women, uh, an area, Mbire is an area that's really prone to child marriage. It's a very big issue there. And um, generally the dynamic you would think when you hear of this is that they're mature adult men in that area taking young girls and making them wives. But we had to go into that area, into that space, um, using a very human-centered, co-creative approach uh, to understand their cultural practices, understand what exactly is happening. And what we actually learned was that young people were marrying each other because the, the, the cultural dynamic was that if you got married, you would then have access to land. Um, so they would want to leave their homes where there's you know, eight or nine other children, whatever the case may be, and then start a new life only to find that marriage and life and children was not that easy. And many of the young men then would leave these young women with children. So we were able to, uh, to have conversations with older, young, older um, young women as well as girls and understanding that dynamic whilst transferring the skill of entrepreneurship, we were able to start a conversation around a different way of thinking about how a young woman can change her future outcomes. And that was um, an, a really great opportunity. At the same time, we're seeing where there are a number of these young people leaving the education sector without an education um, that can ensure their livelihoods. Our education ministry has actually shifted in terms of our curriculum to include more of a, um, a cultural learning and explorative process instead of um, focusing just on cramming for exams and passing. And that shift has meant that young people are able to explore and learn and get into, get more into research and explore their minds and expose themselves to new skills, which would then able, enable them to be able to, to plan and create a future for themselves in a, in a sector or in a, in a country perhaps where there are very few jobs in a region where jobs are very hard to come by. So it, it, igniting that imagination, enabling them to, to research and think beyond the dynamic that they live with has been quite an interesting thing that we've seen in Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rudo. Um, by the way, audience, Jenny, Dr. Rampasad, Rosanna, Anonymous, I see you with your questions on Slido. We'll come to them in a second. Well, not a literal second, but we will come to them shortly. Um, Sandra from the British Council, I'm going to just invite you in now from what you've heard and from your experience as the British Council playing a key role in coordinating various global thinking and activities around these issues. Um, can you tell us, you know, the British Council's perspective of the role of culture in the achievement of the SDGs. Thank you, Ojoma. Well, it's really exciting to be here today and really listening to everyone on the panel uh, talk about their experiences and their programs is really um, exciting to see how well aligned the work is because as we are having these conversations, it's really reiterating the role of culture at the heart of the sustainable development goals and how they shape the way that we think about the world and our roles in it and our responsibilities to each other. It's fantastic hearing how sustainable cities and decent work and economic growth have been key factors in, in how everybody's working um, today through, through their work in culture. 
So in recognition of the role that culture in um, culture plays in the in the SDGs, the British Council has aligned the work to look at how culture responds to global challenges, especially thinking about how we value, preserve and nurture cultural heritage, how we stimulate global conversations around climate change, inspire action and encourage inclusive approaches to sustainable development for a better shared future. One of the examples connected to some of the work that uh, colleagues have mentioned is the Cultural Protection Fund, where we have seen firsthand the impact of investing in the protection of cultural heritage from climate change and conflict. The example that I'd like to share is looking at um, the Green Heritage Programme delivered in partnership with the British Institute in Eastern Africa, the National Corporation of Museums and Antiquities of Sudan, uh, which set out to address the gap in the knowledge about climate change in Sudan. So Sudanese culture is closely linked to the environment uh, where they're experiencing dramatic effects of climate change through the increased instances of extreme weather events in the Sahel. And through people-centered approaches, as has been mentioned uh, by other colleagues, the team worked with the local communities to think about the, how to feed into the designs of the exhibitions concerning climate change, and also to put these up in the in three key museums in Sudan. And the impact of this program really demonstrated um, the, the value of the preservation of tangible and intangible heritage through development of these collaborative um, exhibitions. These efforts have really contributed to the preservation of these, these um, cultures and also sharing of insight that has gone on to form the basis of further research, dialogue and, and conversations about this work. And the British Council is really looking at the wider framework similar to UNESCO in what kind of mechanisms can we create that encourage um, these communities and populations to think about solutions that are of um, value to them that are critical to how they want to preserve and engage uh, in their further in, in their further development in their livelihoods. So thinking about that in how we structure programs, how we engage with our communities and how we talk about the work is really critical to fulfilling the ambitions um, outlined in the SDGs. Thank you very much, Sandra. I'm really loving how all of the different examples and perspectives are really diverse and including a range of actors, artists, communities, technical experts, governments, cultural venues, restaurants, NGOs, environmental experts, and so on. So my next question is really, um, how important is it for different stakeholders to work together to enhance the role of culture in achieving the SDGs? Um, mind you, this is in line with SDG 17, which talks about partnerships for the goals. So I'm going to come back to you, panel, um, to tell us about, in your context, how different stakeholders are working together to enhance the role of, of culture in achieving the SDGs. I'm going to come back, shift things around a little bit, come back to you first, Rudo, to answer this first. Thank you, Ojoma. Um, I guess the example that I would give um, in, in thinking about partnerships um, is actually some of the work that uh, Stimulus is doing here in Zimbabwe with the British Council as well as um, Old Mutual. And what we've been able to do is to forge a partnership that focuses on building um, entrepreneurial skills and building capacity in young um, entrepreneurs, young people who are able to then set up businesses and create decent work and employment for other young people um, in Zimbabwe. So we've um, worked with and incubated um, young people from as far east as the Honde Valley, you know, young people create, you know, making banana flour from the mountains up there all the way through to, you know, a young man in Bulawayo, which is our second um, 
uh, capital um, who's using um, recycled waste to make roof tiles and speak to the construction sector. So the, the, the center of it, the partnership model that we were able to create, um, and I must say led by the British Council team here in Harare, uh, bringing us, uh, bringing corporate, bringing us as more of your maybe more civil society themselves as well as international NGO and working together collaboratively and where we can we've been able to in, enter into dialogue with government players as well the, in the Ministry of Youth to try and push that conversation forward to say how can we build that e uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem to help young people to create jobs to ensure their livelihoods and to sort of get away from some of those social ills that they then end up in whether it be drugs and alcohol and so on because of unemployment or underemployment so that's an example that I would I would share at this point to Joma. Thanks very much, Rudo. Um, what you are talking about there, Old Mutual, for those who don't know, and I hope I'm not wrong about this, is insurance, right? So that's private sector. Um, yes, private sector. Okay. So Isabel yes. Lopez Estrada in the, in the Q&A was talking about involving public and private institutions to provide funds at seed capital um, for projects using culture as a driver for social change. And I feel like, Rudo, that example that you've just given us is exactly that, where um, diverse institutions like your one, uh, Old Mutual, and the British Council are coming together to achieve what you just described for Zimbabwe. So thank you for that, Rudo. Um, Jonathan, do you want to chime in on this a little bit? So the question is, how are different stakeholders working together in your context to enhance the role of culture in achieving the SDGs? Thanks very much, uh, Jama, for giving me the floor. Um, I think that when it comes to working with different stakeholders, um, where we are in Southeast Asia, we do have our own set of challenges given competing and different priorities for one. Uh, what, but what we are trying to do at the intergovernmental level is really to try to build a greater meeting of minds uh, through awareness building, especially in dialogues and encourage more interface between culture sector and stakeholders from other sectors, especially to consider ways to mainstream culture and the benefits of a culture-centric approach in their work. So one example I could really give here would be what I mentioned earlier about the creative economy, which really involves a diverse set of uh, stakeholders. Uh, certainly, culture sector is just one of the stakeholders. Uh, we have many other stakeholders involved in trying to promote and develop the creative economy. So therein lies uh, its, its challenges. But um, as what I mentioned, uh, we are trying to create a kind of interface that will enable greater meeting of minds uh, between the different stakeholders and find uh, a more mutual entry point of um, coming to consensus in trying to uh, develop a concert uh, set of efforts to promote and develop the creative economy. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, well, let's take one more response on this. Uh, Emmanuel, do you want to come in with a sort of multilateral, broad UNESCO perspective on how different stakeholders are working to enhance the role of culture in achieving the SDGs? Thank you very much, Roma. Yes, I feel that also in the multilateral uh, context, we need to, to work differently. We need to work more collaboratively. Um, to, if we are to harness culture for the, for the SDGs and for sustainable development. Let me give you just a few examples of this. Within the UN system, UNESCO launched last year an interagency platform on culture for sustainable development. It brings together a number of UN agencies and other international partners, around 30 of them. And it acts as a space to share information, but also to work together to, to jointly plan and implement. And I feel that such collaborative platforms are very much needed today. And we would welcome uh, dialogue platforms with other stakeholders, with bilateral development agencies, for example, or with civil society networks to discuss about culture and development. Another aspect which I wanted to flag is that I think we also need to be more flexible and collaborative in the ways uh, that we collect and analyze data in the way that we monitor trends related to culture and sustainable development. And one example of this that I invite you to take a look at is the UNESCO Culture and Public Policy Tracker, which is a monthly bulletin published by UNESCO, and where we're trying to gather uh, data from a diversity of, uh, of sources 
uh, to bring a broader picture of the of the trends of, uh, related to, to cultural and sustainable development. So thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel. I do subscribe to that newsletter and I, it's rich indeed. So yeah, encourage people to, to find it and show a quick Google and you, you will find it if, if we're not able to put in the chat. Um, before I come to audience questions, um, I'll try and sneak in one more question for the panel. And I'll come to you first, Enrique, with this question. Um, is culture really a common good? Should we start um, considering culture more as a common good and therefore in practice entrenching cultural participation more as the human rights? There's no answer to that, <laughs> but over to you. <laughs> Um, okay, it seems like we're struggling to get Enrique. Francis, do you want to take that? Let me give it a go. Um, so I think, um, uh, yes, so I think cultural participation is one of the, the rights in the, the Universal Human Declaration, uh, Declaration of Human Rights. So I think absolutely, yes. Um, and I think it's really helpful to think of it as a kind of common good and a specific entitlement. Um, when we're thinking about culture and SDGs, because I think there's a, a lot of the time um, there's a tendency and it is important, but to focus on those kind of uh, artists and on cultural production and creative industries and these kind of tangible things that are focused on production of arts and production of culture. But there's actually so many rich and really important things that are happening around practice of culture. Um, and even in the the small example that I shared, um, just around kind of community rituals or or people having access to arts and culture in their daily life, and I think it it's helpful to to focus on it in this sense as well as um, the other senses because in order for people to have the opportunity to participate in culture, then we need to think about how and who makes those those opportunities to to engage in artistic processes, in artistic projects, um, have cultural experiences, who makes that happen, and then think about how they can be supported to do that work. So I, yeah, I think it's very important. Thank you, Francis. We've now got Enrique back. Do you want to, to um, try again, Enrique? So the question was, culture as a common good, should we be entrenching cultural participation more in practice as a, a basic human right? Um, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we think of our job much more than organizing entertainment in terms of culture, but basically understanding that culture is a tool for development and that as long as we are not able to bring everybody on board in terms of cultural activity, cultural participation, cultural inclusion, we will not be able to promote the uh, development agenda in our city or our country. Um, Pase Cultural, Cultural Pass, I, I shared that experience. It's, it's basically aimed towards that objective, that everybody that attends our public schools, it's actually participating actively in, in the cultural activity of, of our city. In a way, you, you own the city when you own the, the, the culture of the city, because you, you can travel around the city and, and feel that you are entitled to culture, you know, that it's part of of, of 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 your rights as you as you, as you said um it's not that easy to measure cultural participation uh, especially cultural i would say ownership or something you know something related to how you actually own it in terms of, of having the the experience it and it's really really difficult because of course if uh, if you are not um uh, in a way trained in the ways of culture it's very difficult afterwards to to learn them you know i have two daughters very young six and three years old and we read to them every night we take them to museums and and to theaters and music concerts and i'm sure that when they grow up that it's going to be very very important for them not only in terms of their uh, aesthetic you know um 
experience, but mainly as a way to get a good job, uh, relate to people that think different to what they think and see that as an opportunity. In that sense, culture is curiosity. Uh, and it's a tool to open up the rest of, of, of your world. And, um, and it's really difficult because you do it basically through families or, or schools, you know? I mean, when you grow up is when you are, in a way, acquiring all these tools that will make you free afterwards. Thanks very much, Enrique. Um, in fact, in, in, on Slido, Avril Joffe and, and Jenny Villa are talking about whether culture should have its own SDG rather than being a sort of cross-cutting uh, um, element on the basis that culture in itself um, and people uh, and nurturing culture in itself is a public good. And I think that chimes well with what you were just talking about there, Enrique. The audience have been waiting quite patiently. So I'm gonna come now on Slido to audience questions and just invite people, if you haven't already put your question, do put your question in the chat. There's a question from Rosanna Lewis who's asking, how can we capture the impact of cultural life in and outside cities to the SDGs to influence development policy to embed a more cultural approach? Enrique, if I may, I'll come back to you. You were talking about the difficulty in measurement, but you want to reflect a little bit on how we capture the impact of cultural life. How have you managed? What sort of metrics are you using in your case, in your city, to try and at least measure the effectiveness um, of, of what you're doing and the contribution of cultural life to the SDGs? I admit it's a tough question, but do you want to give it a go? Well, we have been Minister of Culture for the last four years, and and we, we started with a, like building a new area called data cultura, cultural data. What we are trying to do is to get uh, measurements that allow us to build better cultural policies. Um, so this data, it's, it's really important um, because it allows us not only to build better policies, but also to measure the impact of these policies along its way. Uh, and in some cases with some sophisticated cultural policies as Pase Cultural. We also bring in universities and other institutions that are partners with us, are partnering with us, uh, allowing us to, to go deep, more deeply into what are we measuring. For instance, in Pase Cultural, at the beginning, we had some schools that were not receiving Pase Cultural, and we were comparing schools that did with those that did not receive uh, cultural in order to understand how cultural participation was different in schools that were actively participating in this policy. Um, we're also trying to measure cultural access to culture in terms of distance. So it's on the supply side and on the demand side of culture. If we have enough cultural venues or cultural programs in every neighborhood in our city or not, and of course, we, we do not have, and, and, and of course, and luckily, we have, there's, there are less uh, venues and programs in less developed neighborhoods. And, and that's a problem, probably because we have less uh, demand on, on neighbors, on, on people that live on the, those areas. But that's what we are trying to uh, improve. And the only way to actually understand that is by actually measuring, you know? And it's a, it's a quantity, but also a quality problem because it's, mm. I mean, culture as a public policy is less developed than other areas. Uh, it's interesting because when we arrived four years ago, I had to convince our colleagues in the, the chief of staff office, who are the ones in charge of controlling what we do and providing money, you know, our budget, our year budget. And I, I said, culture can be measured as any other area. And we want to be measured. 
because we want to ask for more money. We understand that we are having a greater impact than what you think. And I understand that I have to provide the information in your language, not mine. I'm not going to convince you by being emotional. I want to convince you because I, I'm fully convinced that culture ha can have a huge impact in our city in terms of development. And so I, I can, uh, if someone is, is particularly interested in this, I can provide uh, uh, further information. You can find me uh, in, in um, e abogadro, e, e for my Enrique and Avogadro for my surname, e abogadro at Gmail or Instagram or Twitter. I'm directly answering all the messages I receive. Thanks very much, Enrique. I think I'm going to get a mug that says I want to be measured because I want to ask you for more money. Love it. Um, there's a question. Actually, before I go to that question, Anonymous are saying, love all the examples, such a great educate, such great educational and cultural projects. And they're saying creativity is the way forward for everything we do and for all the challenges we're facing. Here, here, Anonymous. Um, Nadia was asking on behalf of many people, I'm sure, on the call for what the newsletter that Emmanuel referred to is called. It's the Cultural Development Tracker. And the link to that has just been put on Slido. So if you want to check it out, just click on that link that has been put on Slido. There was also a question from Isabel asking for a catalog with cultural and creative projects. And so Isabel, there is your answer in addition to the one that has already been provided i think um rosanna commented on that but that tracker also provides um information right i'll move to um uh, one other audience question and apologies there's so many comments and questions we're not going to be able to take them all um uh what question should i take next right someone anonymous are asking how do you think climate change impacts the cultural identity of each nation for this one i think i'm gonna go to rudo and then francis if that's okay rudo first um well what we've seen certainly here in in zimbabwe um we had uh, cyclone die um a couple of years back and the devastating impact of um that sort of weather um, event which is not something we have we we have seen for quite a number of years um and just the way that the communities that lived in the eastern highlands were just so ill prepared um for such an event um and how even in some ways, our cultural practices around construction, for example, how their uh, homesteads were set up, even bearing in mind, obviously, the, the mining that goes on in the area and the environmental impact of that and just the whole setup. It was not, um, we, we were not prepared. And so I think definitely um, climate change has a huge impact, um, not just in terms of the weather pattern changes like the cyclone I, I mentioned, but also what we are doing, the, the human impact on the environment around us and how that then impacts how we live um, and how we need to rethink maybe some of the ways we live culturally, particularly in the rural communities um, in Africa. I think uh, that's maybe what, um, and the thought that I would have on that, old German. Thanks very much, Rudo. I'm going to go to Francis next, but after Francis, I will come to you, Sandra, from the British Council. I know the British Council has got the Cultural Protection Fund, which is responding to this very thing. So, Francis, and then we'll come to you, Sandra, to answer the same question. Right. Um, so, where where uh, my organization is working is around the, the Mekong region. Um, and most of the, the artists and the practitioners that, that we're with are kind of independent um, practitioners and they see their work at the intersection of art and society. Um, I think in terms of the way that, that climate change is affecting their work now, I think is really actually deeply linked to culture because so much of the, the art and culture and the cultural kind of methods and artistic processes that our network are working with, the culture is actually really deeply linked to 
uh, the natural environment and natural resources. So as that environment's changing, it kind of it aligns with concerns that people already felt, I think, due to globalization and colonization, all sorts of things about the traditional culture being at risk of being lost. So I think that that there's kind of a both pieces fit together in terms of uh, artists and cultural workers wanting to protect uh, environment and culture hand in hand. Um, but I think there's one programme we've been running uh, during this year called Delta X, and that's uh, specifically it's for alumni of a, a programme that we actually co-created with British Council that was looking at arts and SDGs. Um, and the the focus of that programme on arts and G SDGs was very much about how can cultural leadership contribute to SDGs in, in the region. But the alumni programme Delta X, actually the kind of curatorial team that's leading it at the beginning of the programme, their question was much more posed in terms of, well, in fact, now it's too late. Um, so perhaps our role is, as cultural and creative professionals is to look at helping people to live with what's coming. Uh, it's perhaps no longer about trying to stop things happening, but trying to be innovative and support people to suffer less with with what's coming our way so yeah that's from me thank you thanks thanks francis yeah. sandra sure thanks for the question yes the cultural protection fund is a really important um, facility within the british council for the, the protection of heritage uh, tangible and intangible due to um threats from climate action and um conflict so Coincidentally and usefully, there is um, a small grant fund available for up to 100,000 uh, pounds. I'll share the link in the chat. Um, but this this grant is available for the preservation and protection of archaeological sites and monuments, um, collection of objects, books, documents in museums, libraries, archives, uh, buildings, intangible heritage like uh, customs, festivals, craft, dance, histories of people um, that are all currently really um, affected by, by climate change. And when, when I'm reflecting on programs that we've had in Kenya, for example, thinking about uh, Bookbank, who work with the preservation of um, tangible heritage, which is a museum, a series of three museums in the heart of Nairobi that were having their archives lost to um, damp and changing conditions within the library that were affecting the potential lifespan of archives that are unique to this um, institution. And working through the Cultural Protection Fund, they were able to uh, digitally archive these um, potentially lost pieces of, of heritage and also think of innovative ways to think about um, future heritage and what um, communities are interested in protecting so that they can think about uh, the future and the potential effects of what they have um, that would be lost due to climate action. So I'll put the link in the chat and I really encourage interested parties to have a look at that opportunity. Thanks, Sandra. I promise to the audience that was not a plug. I didn't know that was coming, but what a nice coincidence that there is an opportunity that's open at the at the moment. Um, so thank you. Who asked that question? Thank you to them for asking the question and enabling us to hear about that funding opportunity that's currently open. Um, because of time, unfortunately, Dr. Rampasad, Edgardo, I probably haven't said your name correctly. Apologies for that. Nadia, I know that you've got questions that you've put in, in Slido. Unfortunately, we can't come to your question. The good news is we will include those questions in the recommendations that we share with UNESCO. So rest assured that they will get airtime. Um, unfortunately, just not in this call because of time. Panel, I'm going to come back to you to give us a set of recommendations, talking of recommendations for um, UNESCO and for the ministers um, before we end this session. But before we do that, I'd very much like to hear again from our audience. And so it is back to Slido with another poll. And as a reminder, if you haven't 
yet got Slido, there's a QR code on your screen. You can scan that QR code. It will take you to Slido and you can put in your answer. The question is, in your opinion, where can placing culture at the heart of SDGs have the biggest impact? So the question again is, in your opinion, where can placing culture at the heart of SDGs have the biggest impact? So if you can slide over to Slido and put in your thoughts, that would be most appreciated. Right. Um, so somebody talks about gender inequality, people and planet, communities, inequalities, arts. Somebody says all 28. Um, planet, lots of people are saying planet. Poverty, eradication, for sure. So please, we want more, more comments from you on, on Slido because your thoughts here will also feed into the recommendations that we're, we're producing, bringing people together. Thank you for that. Keep them coming. Creative social development. Yes, for sure. Please keep them coming. Someone else has said uh, poverty. Another person talks about survival, which I'm sure is linked to, to well, I think is linked to poverty as well. Um, inequality. Yes, that has come up. Socioeconomic development is another one that people have said is um, can have the biggest impact. Empathy. Oops, they're now coming too quickly for me <laughs> to drag. Uh, somebody talked about reversing the digital divide. Yes, that's super important. Resilience, social cohesion, um, the economy, education. Yes, for sure. Health. So I think what we're hearing from this poll is really that across all of the SDGs, culture does have a role to play because pretty much all of, of the areas covered by the SDG are being popped in Slido. Although based on your, your comments, um, Planet is coming out tops in terms of the consistency with which people are recommend, uh, recommending that a few final thoughts. Um, somebody has talked about the formal sectors in the arts. Please keep them coming um, on Slido. While I move back to our panel to ask them the last question of our session, we're fast coming to the end um, of this session. So panel, we'll start with you, Francis, this time. If you could make just one recommendation for UNESCO ahead of the Mondiaco summit, what would that recommendation be? Mm. So um, assuming that I think at the Mondia Cult Summit, there'll be a process of starting to advocate for adding a goal for culture itself. Uh, my recommendation is while culture doesn't yet have its own goal, but is serving other goals or a development agenda, I think is really important to um, invest in how cross-sectoral collaboration and cooperation can work um, because we hear a lot about how that's important but I think it actually takes uh, skills and, and time to do that well um, and in terms of the, the arts perspective kind of training uh, or professionalizing somehow how uh, uh, cultural professionals can be in service of uh, SDGs I think would really help so that it we don't have to to adapt to a development way of thinking, but can actually profess, professionalize artistic processes to support that as they're doing anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Should we go to you next, Enrique? What one recommendation would you make to your fellow ministers about um, culture in the SDGs? Well, probably to, to think outside the box and, and outside the realm of culture. Uh, I think that part of our challenge is actually to getting people to understand the importance of culture who are not involved in culture on a daily um, <clears throat> way. So I'm not sure, I mean, but it's still, I think that our narrative, it's very nice for people who are already convinced, but not for people who are uh, not part of our conversation. And uh, I think that's a problem. I'm constantly 
uh, thinking schemes to when I have um, weekly, uh, we have cabinet uh, meetings every week with uh, the, the mayor and, and the cabinet. And I'm constantly thinking in how can I uh, make them understand the impact of culture and the, the possibilities that we have. Um, and it's not by uh, insisting on, on what we already know because that's not working. So I'm not sure how, but I would say that that's in the, the, the main challenge. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, shall we go to you, Jonathan, for your recommendation? I would like to draw an observation from the room decoration of the G20 Ministers of Culture, as one of the colleagues have uh, mentioned earlier as well, last year, where he actually placed the importance of uh, digital culture alongside movable, immovable, tangible and intangible cultural heritage. So I would therefore hope to see that um, at this upcoming conference itself, that they may also wish to consider the important role of digital culture in its formulation. So thank you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Rudo, do you want to go next? Sure, thank you, Ojoma. Um, I think what I would um, recommend is in twofold. Um, the first being, um, you know, really following the thread from 2021, where, um, you know, cre the creative economy was um, you know, really championed by, I think it was UNESCO or UNICTAD, um, when it comes to sustainable development. So really um, enabling the mainstreaming um, of the creative economy um, and enabling or supporting um, a, an inclusive environment whereby communities um, who and many is particularly in Africa many communities um, have a lot of their livelihoods entrenched in cultural practices traditional uh, making of basket weaving etc so being able to um, co-create uh, uh, sustainable solutions to build up those communities to make them resilient um, and thereby sort of building up the creative economy um, to enable, you know, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and also to shift the the dynamic where you have a lot of rural communities that are negatively impacting the environment due to poverty. So this is the this sort of thread of thinking, co-creation, developing processes of engaging communities and meeting them where they are from an empathetic point of view, um, and then moving with them towards solutions and not sort of having a top-down approach, but rather a bottom-up approach to how culture can be infused um, into then uh, solutioning, particularly around the, the cre creative um, expression. And I would just say that also, whilst I, I definitely agree with Francis that uh, making culture um, an SDG of its own is important, but just like we've seen with gender Gender. If gender is when gender was put in a box, it was the gender ministry responsible for that, and it's over there and it's in that corner. But as soon as we started the campaign towards let's mainstream gender, let's gender should be infused in everything that we do. This, we started to see small shifts in the dynamic, particularly at policy level. And I would encourage the same for culture to say, how do we infuse culture in everything? Because it already intrinsically is there, but we now need to make a deliberate effort to do so. And that's something that the ministers can drive um, from their offices. So hopefully we'll be able to see some of that um, in the discussions in September. Thank you, Ojoma. Thank you very much. And, and maybe the answer is not either or, maybe both. Maybe both as a, as a transversal thing and yeah. in addition to being its own SDG because culture in itself is a public good as I think it was Avril who said that in the, in the, on Slido. Um, let's see, we haven't come to you, Emmanuel. We can't really ask Emmanuel to... <laughs> to give us a recommendation for UNESCO, where Emmanuel is from. But Emmanuel, do you want to reflect on any of those recommendations or add anything to the thoughts? Um, thank you very much, Ujoma. Yeah, I think we have a lot of uh, interesting uh, food for thought here uh, about how to shift our advocacy and storytelling to think outside the box, uh, investing in, in cross-sectoral cooperation, mainstreaming culture and the sustainability 
discussions and engaging uh, communities more robust, robustly. Um, maybe just to, to tell you that uh, we are, uh, as we are in the run up to the Mondia Court uh, process, these questions, uh, among other questions, are also on the table. And we are currently in the process of negotiating the final declaration of the conference, which will uh, kind of flag the ways forward for the cultural policies. And this is a this is an intergovernmental process. It's a negotiation process with the, with the countries. And among the the issues which are very critically on the table are uh, issues related to cultural rights. How can we uh, have a more uh, robust uh, rights based approach to cultural policies? And of course, as uh, Jonathan was flagging, issues related to the digital transformation. How can we make the digital transformation an asset for the cultural sector? How can we also make sure to uh, preserve our cultural diversity uh, in the digital environment and address a number of uh, limitations? And I, I also would like to comment upon this issue about the transversality of culture, because it's true that uh, we have been talking a lot about how culture is transversal to the SDGs. And uh, at some point, it's our strengths. But at the same time, when culture is everywhere, culture is nowhere. So we have also seen the limitations of, uh, of this approach. And maybe just to, to finish, and going back to your question earlier, question of Joma about uh, flagging culture, positioning culture uh, as, as a common good. If you allow me, I will maybe shift a little bit the language to positioning culture as, uh, as a global public good. And I think there's an interesting, uh, a very strong interest now within the UN. So I think we have kind of a door open and the uh, UN Secretary General reached out to UNESCO uh, in, in the, as part of the reflection of the post 2030 um, and uh, invited UNESCO to, to engage a broad reflection of how, on how we could uh, better position culture as a global public good. And in this reflection, there are two main pillars. One, again, is about cultural rights. You were mentioning uh, the issues of cultural participation. This is part of the cultural rights. And the other is uh, culture's impact on the broad uh, development uh, spectrum. And I feel we have kind of a promising way forward in that, in that sense. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Emmanuel. Um, I'm gonna move swiftly now to Sandra. From the British Council standpoint, is there anything that you think we've missed or that you'd like to emphasize? Thanks, Ojoma, and thank you, colleagues, for your generous contributions. I think that's been such a rich conversation. Um, the only thing that I'd like to perhaps emphasize or appoint people to is the Missing Pillar Report and the dialogue series that was um, hosted by the British Council in collaboration with UNESCO and other partners that explores the place of culture in the SDGs through research policy and practice. And the talks especially really aim to provide inspiration, connection, and solidarity to build a common sense approach um, to community and how we value culture for sustainable development. So I will post a link in the chat and I hope you can all have a chance to look at it. And we are excited to say that uh, we are entering the second phase of this research and look forward to inviting you all again to talk more about these connections and uh, between the SDGs and culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. I won't belabor the insightful points that have been raised in this panel. And so I just want to close by leaving us with a quote that's been attributed to Marcus Garvey, the Jamaican activist and orator. They talk about the fact that a people without knowledge of their past history, origin and culture are like a tree without roots, end quote. So to my mind, to achieve any kind of development progress, there's no doubt that we must put culture at the heart of everything. Otherwise, we will end up being a set of well-fed, well-educated and healthy trees without roots. On that note, I just want to say thank you to the panelists, to the amazing audience and to the British Council and the BCCF for organizing and thanks to myself for moderating this session. Thanks everyone and have a good rest of your day.
Hello and welcome back. Uh, my name is Jonathan Holloway. I'm your moderator for this session. Uh, it's great to be returning. Um, I'd like to start off by welcoming you to the third in our series of high-level dialogues organized by the British Council in partnership with the World Cities Culture Forum. Thank you. I'd like to join, in fact, uh, Ojama Achai in thanking herself and the panelists from the last session. That was absolutely superb. Many, many things we can take out of that, uh, many lessons and learnings uh, about culture at the heart of sustainable development goals. As we approach Monday Occult 2022, UNESCO's World Conference on Cultural Policy and Sustainable Development, which will take place in Mexico in September, we know that ministers will be gathering from all around the world to talk about culture, to talk about the SDGs, to talk about policy that will define the world for the next decade. And this is our chance to influence them. Um, we're now speaking, it's, uh, we've got people joining us from all around the world. It's uh, in Mexico, it's one o'clock, so just before lunch. Uh, here in uh, Europe, it's seven o'clock or eight o'clock if you're in mainland Europe, uh, just before dinner. And if you're in uh, East Asia, it's about two in the morning and you're probably just about to have a midnight snack. Now, delighted to welcome a fantastic panel today who again are joining us from all around the world. And of course, to you, the people joining us, um, watching, who are going to ask questions using Slido, who are joining us from around the world, from Azerbaijan to Zimbabwe. We've been doing our best today to make our sessions interactive by using polls and Q&A on Slido. Slido is completely brilliant. Uh, the first one we're going to do in a moment. Um, if you have a chance now, could you please open Slido on your app? You can see there is, I believe, yes, a QR code. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, it's late here. Um, a QR code. Uh, go to that. Open Slido either on your browser or on your device, or indeed, if you have the app, open that. The number is 925-9330. And we're going to start immediately by asking uh, a question, a poll, a multiple choice, A to E. What do you think is the most important trend in the cultural sector right now? Uh, the choices are A, better articulation and evidence of culture's social impact. B, supporting fragile ecosystems of livelihoods of professionals. C, increased solidarity. D, accelerated adoption of digital practices. E, adaptation of strategic models across the value chain. The most important trend in the cultural sector. I see Hamilton uh, was not one of the options. Uh, that possibly would have been mine. Um, could have gone with anything by Lemon Mar Miranda. Thank you. Um, people are now voting. Yeah, we're getting some responses here. And as we wait for people to to read this in both languages, um, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Yes, here we go. We have 20% believe accelerated, oh, 27% believe in accelerated adoption of digital practices or adopción accelerado de practicas digitales in Spanish. Uh, thereby, I apologize to our Spanish people joining us. Uh, now, as that continues and we find that, uh, yes, digital is accelerating even as we speak uh, to almost 50%. This session is about culture at the heart of future thinking for transformational change. We all recognize culture's intrinsic value. We see the potential for culture to play a transformative part in shaping more peaceful and prosperous societies. That's where we are today. We need to get that message across. Thinking beyond 2030, how can we reach consensus on the place of culture in development policy at a local, city, national, and international level? Joining me to discuss this are Ege Yildirim, who is a heritage planner with 25 years of experience working in Turkey and internationally. Ayeta Wanguza, executive director of culture and development for East Africa. Trinidad Zaldivar, Chief of the Cultural Solidarity and Creativity Affairs Division at Inter-American Development Bank, based out of Washington. Pierre-Luigi Sacco, Professor of Economic Policy, University of Chieto Pescara, and Senior Advisor to the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. And Rosanna Lewis, who is a senior relationships manager heading up the culture responding to global challenges team at the British Council in Brussels. So welcome, welcome to you all. It's fantastic to have you here today. First, 
I'm going to ask all of our speakers to say a few words, their observations and experiences on today's topic about culture at the heart of transformational change. Um, and the first I'm going to turn to for your thoughts is Ege, please. Can you hear me all right? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Um, as Jonathan said, um, good morning and good evening. Uh, good night to everyone. Uh, thank you for this wonderful panel. It's exciting to be with all our distinguished speakers. Um, thank you to, to, to the British Council and to the World um, Cities Culture Forum uh, for hosting us. Um, I'm from the International Council on Monuments and Sites this evening, ICOMOS, um, the primary cultural heritage networks um, professionals network um, around the world um, advising UNESCO on um, one of their um, six culture um, instruments, the World Heritage Convention, um, but also um, trying to engage with many other um, subjects beyond world heritage, all cultural heritage, and nowadays beyond cultural heritage, but all culture and even beyond culture, all kinds of sustainability issues. So um, our domain is expanding and uh, this is a great um, occasion to discuss those kinds of things. Um, so we're giving about three minutes, um, as I uh, was told, I'll be uh, trying to stick to that. Um, so culture and sustainable development, um, what are our main insights? Uh, well, I um, would like to share with you uh, by starting uh, about how the crises of our times are all interlinked. Uh, climate change, pandemics, um, health issues, justice and equity issues, capitalist consumption models. And while these are interlinked, the solution is also interlinked and culture lies at the heart of such an interlinked um, paradigm. And uh, maybe that's why we still have not gotten on track for, um, with achieving the SDGs, because we're still missing the cultural dimension. It's not properly represented in there as yet. Um, culture seems to be actually a key factor in the problems, and that's why it would be a key factor in the solutions of these problems. Um, we are at ECOMOS also part of um, a, a network, a campaign for um, having actually a culture goal in itself, the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign, with um, uh, seven other international cultural networks um, headed by UCLG, United Cities Local Governments. Um, and uh, we are um, advocating for uh, the cultural dimension to be recognized as like the fourth force, just like the social dimension, the economic dimension and the environmental dimension, but perhaps not looking at these in um, a pillar kind of uh, mentality, or, um, because we also call them the three pillars of sustainability. Uh, maybe they should be braced around and culture is a glue that brings together different dimensions. So culture as um, the kind of the soft tissue, um, perhaps, that mobilizes and catalyzes everything else. Um, again, with ECOMOS, um, we've been trying to engage uh, this kind of new, new mindset, more holistic mindset, um, acceleratingly in the last um, a couple of years, actually. I mean, it's been, this has been going on for uh, two decades now at ECOMOS, but uh, more and more, uh, more powerful um, actions that we're trying to take. Uh, in 2020, we declared a climate emergency, like many, um, other entities around the world are doing. Uh, one resolution I'd like to share is uh, quite in important, uh, Resolution 20GA19 um, on people-centered approaches to heritage. So we are trying to make our domain of cultural heritage preservation more about people. Um, and uh, this means prom uh, promoting connections of people with heritage and places, uh, promoting intercultural dialogue and understanding, uh, looking at sustainability and well-being at the center when addressing um, uh, local, national and international heritage policies and practices, um, and trying to realize the full potential of cultural heritage to deliver climate resilient pathways, um, you know, a transition uh, with justice into low carbon futures, um, as we're all talking about and also synergizing the heritage sector with other sectors, um, not only the um, more classical tourism sector perhaps, but um, also peace building and conflict resolution, social and health services, uh, nature and biodiversity um, preservation, um, infrastructure and energy provision. Um, there's um, All SDGs are interlinked and uh, heritage um, is finding a place in them as well. Um, and there was a question in our briefing also um, I, about reaching consensus on the place of culture in development pol policy at different levels, local, national, international level. What I could emphasize for you um, 
from our perspective is uh, well localizing the SDGs means putting them into a cultural diversity context, the cultural context, using local sense of pride and identity, dignity and citizenship. These all really happen at local level. Uh, looking at uh, the um, case studies that are powerful sometimes coming up from the lo uh, local level, uh, grassroots experiences to share and replicate. At the national level, empowering local levels and harnessing diversity. And here there's a lot of politics of culture again, why it's both a problem and the solution, uh, looking looking at culture head on to in, change entrenched behaviors, um, uh, using culture as an agency for creative thinking and hacking established ideas. Uh, we really draw inspiration from the youth and climate movement, of course, who are doing exactly that. And this is about creating a culture of sustainability, maybe we could call them. At the international level, um, well, UNESCO is, of course, a key um, actor. That's why we're all talking about Mondia Cult today. Um, more UNESCO civil society engagement more UNESCO UN wider um, system engagement partnering uh, beyond the culture sector um, is something that we um, uh, would like to see encouraged uh, great things happening but more um, should be happening going beyond GDP about the metrics of things uh, looking at qualitative and quantitative data together um, and uh, there is a historic opportunity at Mondia cult uh, where uh, a lot the resolution in, uh, that will be um, put out and uh, will be an important outcome but it's not just that outcome it's not it should not be static it should be a process that we're all following and engaging with. Um, it's a new era and it doesn't stop at Mondia Cult, so a lot of work cut out for us. Um, I'm already over time. Apologies. Um, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ege. That was fantastic and hugely thought-provoking. Um, I'd like to remind uh, people who are watching, they can ask questions in the in the Slido in Q&A. Please do begin to get those going. Now I'd like to ask the same question about the topic, an example, and what your feelings are to Ayeta Wangusa. <clears throat> Thank you, Jonathan. Could I have my slide uh, pulled up so that I speak to my slide? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, as you introduced me, I work for an organization called uh, Culture and Development East Africa. And um, our vision is actually to see that culture is placed at the center of development. So our, our organization began in 2011, and that was before uh, the current sustainable development framework. And at that time, <clears throat> we're already saying that, uh, <clears throat> sorry, would like to see culture at the center of development. But we also had a global objective uh, that was to see culture uh, uh, integrated uh, within public policies. And when we talk about public policies, we're talking about the, the environmental, uh, the you know, economic and the social. So this journey began uh, because we felt that uh, culture was really at the periphery of development discourse, not only in East Africa, but in, in Africa. And so we thought we could start somewhere. So during the process of advocating for the, you know, the sustainable development goals, we were part of the process of you know, advocating for a goal because we feel that there are two pathways to actually deal with uh, culture and development. The first one is like what this diagram illustrates, uh, which is culture being at the center of the three pillars of development discourse. And the, th se uh, the second one is actually about culture as a state of being, being in harmony with the environment. And that is a journey in which we walk into, so that at one point we'll talk about harmony. But what were the hurdles Oh, what are some of the hurdles we are facing uh, within this current uh, sustainable development framework? Of course, we all know that uh, it is a neoliberal hegemonic development framework, and uh, its characteristics is that it you know, um, advocates for cultures of competition and individual self-interest, uh, a domineering capitalist globalizing system, you know, uh, unsustainable production and consumption patterns when it comes to manufacturing and all that. And when it comes to the think tanks, we feel that they're politically affiliated to a, you know, forums that, you know, direct the economic agenda that is capitalistic with a few that counter that, uh, especially in the West. <clears throat> so when we look at ourselves as a creative hub, uh, we are, uh, 
kind of see ourselves as the bridge between what is happening now and providing insights for the future. And we are looking at, for example, you know, asking questions as how can creative think tanks uh, within Africa or even in other parts of the world contribute to the new thinking? And that new thinking beyond 2030, as one of the questions uh, for this panel asked, is we would like to see a transition beyond what is happening now that is more inclusive uh, of different uh, categories of people, be it indigenous or creative people in sustainable development. And uh, what do we see, what, what characteristics do we envision? We envision values of more cooperativism uh, and a shared economy rather than more individualistic you know, agendas that have pushed cultural actors at the periphery. We, we are also thinking about you know, more fair interaction between local you know, systems and global. We know that globalization is already in you know, uh, domineering, the domineering system, but we also have you know, local uh, ideas springing from below and we need to see a balance and fairness between the two. In terms of the planet, uh, and in contrast with uh, the consumption patterns that are happening now, it's the, a direction where we see more solidarity. Like I said earlier before, the goal is to see that culture becomes that state of <clears throat> being where we're in harmony with the environment and begin reversing some of the issues that are going on. And then, of course, uh, finally, uh, it's the issue of um, um, finally, it's the issue of having uh, creative think tanks like the one that we are running, uh, informing development processes, because right now we are still at the periphery, even if it is, you know, a struggle to daily, you know, inform uh, uh, development processes, but we would really love to see that uh, the cultural think tanks are part of uh, uh, the development process. Thank you. Thank you, Ayata, and um, thank you for one of my favourite slides uh, of ages. I think as that slide is absolutely brilliant. I thought that when you showed it before. Um, now, I'd like to um, ask the same question to Trinidad. Thank you, and uh, thank you for this invitation. And I love uh, what Ayata was saying about the periphery. Uh, I would say that one of the things that uh, you mentioned also at the beginning is that uh, we there's a right now like a common ground that uh, culture it it's important and, and acts as an agent of transformation and social cohesion uh, generates more inclusive and safer communities also that it has a positive impact in our health it it helps us to develop social skill empathy it is also know that the impact of the cultural and creative industries in our economy is relevant its contribution to GDP, how it creates uh, its intensive in job creation, uh, especially for young and, and uh, young people and also women. Uh, we have studies and numbers that corroborate this statement. And nevertheless, there's uh, no correlation between all of this and the role that culture uh, has in the development strategies of our countries. And this, uh, there are many reasons probably for that. Uh, I, I'm not going to go to them, but uh, but in a way, uh, Sarita was saying, uh, we are in the, the culture is in the periphery, or I would say it's isolated. And uh, one of the things that we have been seeing in the uh, by working uh, with culture in the Inter-American Development Bank is uh, that we have to build a better narrative around this issue and present how culture can support and enable the different areas of our society and the economy uh, and and that is and, and to put uh, culture at the table of decisions it's not a, an afterthought something that we invite when we when we had all the decisions made but have culture there and and in this case uh, it, it going from the periphery to the center to the center of the decisions, uh, having all these uh, all these uh, statements uh, that we already that I already uh, said. So, 
this is this is one of, of the things that I think it is important. And, and then culture has been probably in the past being isolated and speaking their own language and their own uh, uh, jargon and for many people was kind of scary and still today uh, when we talk at least in a development bank about putting culture in the in the middle of the strategies for for the the development of our countries there's a, a little skepticism it's not seeing as an investment so it's a spending and uh, right now we we have been building a, a different a narrative and, and now we have a, a, a lot of things to do with this and it, it's, a, it's a new scenario. And, uh, but for this culture needs to go and needs to uh, work uh, in the intersection with other sectors and, uh, and with other parts of the, of the economy. For instance, uh, we, we know that culture and the uh, cultural and creative industries can play a central role in the development and management of sustainable cities. On one hand, they, they can contribute to boosting the economy uh, of uh, depressed neighborhoods and areas, or increase the attractiveness of cities as destinations to live, to visit, to invest. Likewise, culture can transform urban economies through the generation of new jobs and the promotion of innovation which contributes to increasing productivity levels and quality of life by creating a collaboration systems with other productive sectors uh, that could be traditional or emerging. So what we see for the future is a role for culture, a key role for culture uh, in many different areas. It's not just culture uh, as a uh, public good that it will continue to be a really important part of this, but also culture as an asset for the development of, of different strategies for different sectors in our communities. I hope I use my time wisely. I was attempting to use my unmute button wisely. Yes, you did. That was fantastic. <laughs> That's three excellent presentations so far. Um, now, please, uh, Pierre Luigi. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And um, and it's really nice to to have a chance to speak uh, after Ege Trindad and Nayeta because uh, I will reconnect to some of the thoughts that they already put forward. Uh, first of all, I would like to launch a note of optimism. It's true that uh, culture is still very critical in agenda setting, but fortunately things are starting to change. For example, as, a, as it was mentioned, I am a senior advisor to the OECD now. The OECD that for a very long time did not really prioritize culture. Now is really giving attention to it on a major scale. And we have just published a, a report that is freely downloadable called the Culture Fix that is very much about this how culture can make a difference at local development strategies, but also as a very important item for future strategic development. As Trinidad was saying, clearly this is one major future line of development and the OECD is very much focused on this and we are starting lots of collaboration with different countries. For example, we recently launched a report on Colombia on the Economia Naranja, that uh, as it is uh, well known, has been one of the most interesting experiments so far in this field. The second element of optimism is that also the European level, there is now really a major upscaling of uh, the strategic relevance of culture. Europe, has the most ambitious projects of the European Union are the so-called innovation ecosystems, the so-called KIC, knowledge and innovation communities. So far, KICs have been dedicated to issues like climate, food, manufacturing, or urban uh, transportation. So really key issues. So it's not, um, at this point, so it's not uh, minor at all. The fact that the new kick that has just been launched by the European Union is on culture and creative industry. Uh, this is the biggest project as it comes to financing of the whole European Institute of Technology portfolio. So only the financing by the, the, start, the seed financing by the European uh, Commission is 150 million euros, but that's just the beginning. And then, of course, this really aims at uh, positioning uh, culture and creative production, not simply as a point uh, of uh, 
future, uh, let's say, competitiveness of Europe and so on and so forth, but really fostering a new global effort in this direction. And here I totally hear what Ayeta was saying. Clearly, we have now a problem also of uh, connecting this to the big societal challenges and to issues of uh, social justice. And from this point of view, I should say that in spite of the fact that today, for example, most of the uh, big platforms, for example, digital content production platforms are being developed by the West, it must be remarked that uh, mo most of what happens in the business environment, in the traditional cultural sectors, is very much about exploiting the already existing uh, incumbent uh, positions, for example, in terms of uh, just uh, extending the usual logic and cultural creative industry, the pre-digital one, to the new digital realm. That's not very innovative. What's really, uh, what, where the innovation is really flourishing is in the global south. I think that most of the really interesting things today are happening in places like Africa, like Southeast Asia, South America, just to make examples, and of course the Far East, where there is also some interesting, uh, let's say, cross-contamination between the traditional cultural industry and a new emerging one. I should also add, just to complete the picture, that in this uh, favor favorable scenario, there is also a huge upscaling of scientific attention towards culture. So for a while, we have considered culture basically as uh, one way of entertaining people, more or less exclusive socially, more or less, um, let's say, uh, educated and sophisticated, but basically uh, entertaining and free time and leisure. So what's becoming clear, and that was also mentioned by Trinidad, is that uh, culture really plays an incredibly profound and complex role uh, at the cognitive level at the behavioral level. So we understand, for example, today that uh, it's through uh, cultural participation, for example, that people learn to cope with unfamiliar ideas, and that's the seed of innovation. It's through for certain forms of culture that people have uh, learned to cope with their emotional mood, and this is a key to mental health, and sometimes even, uh, of course, uh, health, what, health uh, uh, period. And uh, at the same time, there is a, a very, very big uh, line of research in social neuroscience that uh, explains how, for example, certain forms of culture, especially those that include, that, that uh, entail coordinated movement or forms of, uh, of intimate contact and dialogue are, for example, key for social cohesion. So we are really understanding that through an enhanced, understand, uh, and, uh, enhanced study of these properties of culture, we can in some sense get rid of this prejudice that since culture is mostly about entertainment is not really crucial for the big societal challenges, is not crucial for the social development goals, and so on and so forth, is exactly the contrary. Insofar as we really understand this and we streamline this new line of research into the policy agenda, we probably can start a completely new cycle. Thank you very much. Pierre Luigi, thank you so much. And you, you inserted a, a note of optimism. Uh, I think we all probably need just a moment to, uh, to cope with that because it's been a while. So thank you mm -hmm. for that. So after those excellent four uh, presentations, um, I, I want to ask a question now of uh, the person who here, in effect, uh, ha has that connective tissue element, the, the person who moves between the sectors, uh, Rosanna from the British Council. Um, we've heard uh, uh, thoughts from the heritage approach. We've thought about the community approach. We've heard about the corporate world and what needs to happen there and, and the world of academia and education. From your point of view as one of those link organizations that, that regularly brings all these people together, what's your sense? What, what do you think is the thing we need to be doing between now and 2035? Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, everyone. It's It's been a fascinating day of panel discussions and to see that evolution from the conversation around culture at the heart of public policy to then culture within the SDGs and now thinking about the future and how we can affect transformational change is really exciting and I'm delighted to be here and to be joined by such distinguished and impressive speakers. Um, so I think 
what's interesting about the future thinking is moving beyond 2030 and the agenda that we currently have and looking at what are the trends and movements where is the conversation going what has already been said and and what has been working in this space of advocating for arts and culture and development and, and where do we need to change our approach um, and i think british councils in this space of reflection of learning we're going into a second phase of research um, into the missing pillar which we published back in 2020 to go back and analyze the policy development since then, the practice <clears throat> highlights some case studies of our own, but also of our partners and those who have been doing excellent work to try and advocate, but also to effect change on the ground. And then to think about what does that future look like? What, where is culture within um, the development sphere in terms of what future do we want and how are we gonna get there? And I think what's interesting is that time and time again, the same issues come up and I think that they should be at the center of how we approach development rather than um, the how, uh, it should be the what and, and the why. So things like um, a values and rights-based approach, a people-centered, community-centered uh, and planet-centered approach, <clears throat> the interdisciplinary, holistic, cross-cutting aspect around development and, mm -hmm. and the role that culture plays within that as, as a form of human nature, and this sense of local and global, um, how we can connect what's happening on the ground, what's tangibly uh, possible, um, and how do we listen to the people who are experiencing the global challenges of today um, and include them in what that future uh, will look like. So those are just some initial thoughts I've had. Uh, I've been taking furious notes throughout this and previous panels, and hopefully I can keep contributing to this conversation with, with the other panelists today. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. That's fantastic. Um, I'd like to move on to some questions and please keep uh, audience questions coming in. Uh, we're getting some excellent ones in, but I, I want to start by asking um, the question uh, to Ege. One of the things we've everybody has touched on is how do we shift culture and the conversation about culture from the from the edge to the core, to the very center? How do we get to that point whereby it is an essential part of the conversation in the same way uh, that that law and uh, civic society and safety and health and sport and all, mm -hmm. all the other bits that make up society. How do we shift culture to be absolutely at the core of that? Mm. Simple question. <sighs> Yeah, so simple. Well, <laughs> one can um, go on and on and get lost or uh, try to uh, say it simply. Um, well, one thing is that uh, if we're talking as cultural sector people, um, I think today we're not all culture sector necessarily. I'm happy to see um, banking world speakers, you know, and so reaching out beyond ourselves, being self-critical. There's a lot of homework for cultural sector people. We need to go out there and be less scary, as it was said, you know, and start to speak the language that other people talk about development. Um, and uh, so, but also um, be bolder and uh, more self-assured about um, how everybody needs culture. It's not just for the culture sector's uh, pe um, members' own well-being. It's it's to save everybody's well-being. It's a responsibility we owe, um, I think, uh, to to whole of society. Um, and uh, here, I think we have to keep asking for being at the decision-making table from the outset, um, as it was said. Uh, so try to make sure that these uh, reports, re development uh, plans, programs, policies are made with some cultural actors in the process. You know, um, consult cultural actors, cultural agents, uh, experts on this, um, and also advocate for um, across the board uh, cultural inclusion, um, not just in a sector. Uh, and sometimes I think we have to go beyond our own established thinking. We belong everywhere um, and, and go out to unconventional partners to speak with. Uh, so that's, um, I think, more our homework. Uh, other than that, um, about how to put it um, at the center. Um, well, 
actually data is key of course yeah it's difficult it's 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 uh a general problem we have with qualitative um, data being uh, more available than quantitative, uh, but it's it's not impossible uh, to quantify um, relevant data that will make culture uh, a stronger case. And um, I'd like to give the example of the World Health Organization um, because they uh, set, issued a very interesting report about the connection of arts and health uh, very recently. And uh, I mean, the pandemic was a great opportunity to see how um, arts and culture really are um, good for our well mental well-being. And it was actually scientifically proven in this very good report um, about arts and health. And these need to be amplified. I, it's heartening to hear about the OECD report, the culture fix. We see more of these reports, you know, more interest in that. So all this data needs to be maybe um, there needs to be a meta database where we can find them or an, a better connected network where we, we can reach the, these kinds of uh, information sources and use them um, so the science policy interface um, and always be action oriented um, i would say great thank you thank you um i i want to ask um ayeta now um a similar question but but <clears throat> Actually, we're talking about the link between qualitative, quantitative, and narrative storytelling and, and data. Uh, and, and my question is, what would a more values-based uh, structure and approach look like? How would we tell that story in a way that is more compelling, Ayeta? From your experience, what, when have you seen that story told in a beautiful and exquisite and compelling way? Uh, so maybe I, I can begin by uh, short, telling the story of what's happening at policy level, and uh, we can we can begin to see some shifts, especially when you link that story to the economics of culture. Uh, we see policies now coming up, not necessarily policies alone, but strategies, you know, to begin uh, in you know investing in uh, cultural infrastructure. Uh, we see. Um, uh, culture organizations begin talking, uh, coming up with strategies to see how cultural vibrancy can be measured in cities. I think Ojoma's organization is doing a project around that. But I think in all this, uh, where there is a gap uh, between what the reawakening at the moment and uh, what's happening at the community level is like um, culture was removed from the education system at one point. And so when it was removed, that means you're also removing, uh, you're killing a market for culture, in, for theater goers, for you know, uh, concert uh, goers and all that. So when we talk about uh, measuring, telling the story socially, using social indicators, uh, how many people are going to theater and how many people uh, are buying, you know, the economic, the economic statistics. I think the problem is um, it goes back to the kind of education, and I'm talking about Africa, uh, East Africa to be, to be uh, precise, where, whereby uh, if uh, children are not uh, taught to appreciate culture, then it kills the whole efforts that are being made by the policymakers. But we see uh, some efforts, for example, like in Kenya, whereby the education uh, system is being changed to what they call competence-based uh, education system. And so uh, students will be taught best, I mean, would be encouraged to learn based on what their competencies are. And we are hoping that culture, cultural education will be part of that uh, uh, process. Uh, I'm, I, I'm in touch with someone in Kenya who is actually trying to see that, uh, arts subjects, uh, arts and sports subjects uh, uh, valued in such a way that you can get a certificate out of it because right now that is not happening. So I think if we get it right at, at, uh, through the education system, we are not only uh, uh, growing a, a citizenry that appreciate the arts, we are also growing a domestic market for the arts because right now we find that uh, uh, many artists are frustrated because they produce what is not consumed or only consumed by those who those few who kind of uh, appreciate the arts and and then you find that most artists if it is a visual artist if it's a you know a dancer they have to find markets abroad and yet you find that there is a market uh, that is being killed because of you know the peripheral policies 
that have been embedded within the cultural sector. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, a lot to think about. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, interested, Trinidad, you are probably the person on the panel who has uh, the, the most day-to-day -day experience of uh, representing the arts and culture in on the other side, uh, in, in, in the commercial, very commercial sector. And I wondered, are there examples of projects or arguments or breakthroughs you've had? Are there moments where you've said a thing and it's just the click has happened that we can learn from? Yeah, well, I'm in the commercial, but we are a development bank, so this is a, a, a difference. But but uh, we we have had a couple of aha moments that are really in, in, interesting. First of all, the first aha moment was when we realized that we have to create a narrative and to talk to the finance ministers, not to the cultural se sector, because they, they they agree with us we are all we have all the, the same ideas but the cultural the ministers of uh, finance ministers they are not seeing so culture is invisible many times for them so they see this as something that is not an investment it won't create value so as soon as we learn how to talk to them and to create this narrative the conversation shift immediately it, 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 is, it is incredible. So this is one of the things that we really learn. And if you can see our publications and studies, they're really created for these audiences, for policymakers that are in different areas uh, and the cultural areas, but not just for the cultural audience. And uh, we did last year something that was really interesting and, and we have been replicating this this year, the first policy dialogues, interse intersectoral policy dialogues, uh, after identifying what, what were the main problems uh, for the for cultural and creative industries that they have to really flourish and, 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 and uh, succeed and, and go from being an opportunity to a reality, uh, and this intersectoral uh, dialogue was another aha moment because we started working with them and you feel, you can feel how uncomfortable they were. So the Minister of Labor with the cultural minister and so they were talking, they thought they were talking about different things, but in the end, they really uh, arrived to a common ground and they saw uh, the different uh, public policy instruments that they could use that probably were de uh, developed for one sector that they can use it in in, uh, in the cultural sector to help uh, all the issues that has to do with the, the characterization of employment that is uh, a key issue. So I think it put culture, bring it back, don't have it isolated and uh, and I, I joke many times and I said, okay, when you have the pictures of the ministers, uh, you have the Minister of Finance at the center and the cultural minister is always at the end of the, of the table. We have to push this <laughs> to the center. And that would happen if you start having these conversations and you start building public policies that are intersectoral and you can see how the uh, cultural, um, labor force is not a super special one that it has a very special uh, characteristic but they need same things as others so they need probably the same solutions uh, and that is that is how we have been uh, looking at this and uh, and and also thinking on more than i'm going to quote a famous phrase, but not what the society or the government can do for culture, but what culture can do for the different areas of, of government and the society. There is, I don't know, it, it is huge what culture can do, and not also is, is huge, it's relevant and important. And my last thing is when people, when I'm in, in this meeting with all these uh, policy wonks and, and I hear after when, when we talk about the cultural projects, that these projects are beautiful, I almost cry because they're not beautiful. They're relevant, they're impactful. And uh, if we 
keep looking at the at these sectors as a nice to have after we solve all this problem we're not going anywhere so we have to have the cultural sector at the center to solve this problem great thank you uh, it's uh, it's and, and a really good point about the um, about where culture is placed in politics in the two cities i've worked in running festivals that have been the most successful each of them have the culture portfolio held by either the premier who was the head of the government or the mayor they they took that portfolio for themselves along with other key ones and they did it because they knew the stories were there they knew that uh the soft and also transformational change was there and they knew that they they can get re-elected based on great, great cultural stories. And as soon as we can persuade people of that, it'll be easier. Pierre Luigi, uh, my, my question to you is, is, is obviously we're talking about the whole range of, of, of ways it's, it, it's been used in government and in organizations, but what are we missing? Which, which other key stakeholders are there that we need to persuade if we're going to absolutely get to where we need to get to by preferably September, but if not 2035? Well, the key stakeholders, I think, are the ones that are uh, generally the policymakers outside the cultural realm, because uh, this is where we are still uh, a bit lacking. Because, uh, you know, it's very difficult, for example, to convince today seriously public health officers that cultural participation can be a big uh, and important lack of a future strategy for, uh, for example, resilient uh, mental health, post-pandemic mental health, or in taking seriously certain forms of a, especially a psychosomatic dimension of medicine today from a completely different angle. Or in many cases, for example, uh, people working on uh, climate strategies, environmental strategies, that again, cultural participation can make a huge difference in this regard. So there is an impressive amount of evidence, but uh, we need more projects in which we demonstrate the real potential. From this point of view, I think that what's happening uh, in Europe with the new European Bauhaus is particularly interesting because this is a really ambitious project to consider culture as an overarching uh, context for uh, the green transition of Europe. And uh, there are uh, very interesting examples and laboratories developed in certain European cities. but. Uh, Again, it's a still to narrow base. We need to expand this dramatically. And uh, also in many countries that could really make a difference from this point of view, just to make an example, the United States are very, very narrow-minded in this regard. There's very little experimentation in there. And uh, that's, uh, that's critical in many respects. Again, I see lots of things happening from the bottom up in the global south. Uh, but again, this needs to be also up, up taken and, uh, and, uh, and developed further by the local institutions. So, yeah, it's basically with the policymakers. That's great. And uh, thank you for that. Also, given that what we're saying is that we, um, that we, that we need to start preaching to the unconverted rather than the, to the converted. Uh, question for Rosanna. Um, what can we do to encourage cooperation between all of the different policy organizations and, and get a single script. Is a single script necessary, first of all? And if it is, what are the steps between now and getting to the point whereby people just go, it's obvious, we've heard it, it stays the same? Yeah, thanks for that thought-provoking question. Uh, obviously, cultural diversity and different approaches, different stakeholders will need different narratives. And um, I, I do think that we can have a shared vision of what kind of future world we want to live in, which is more inclusive, which is more sustainable. And there's so many trends and movements moving in that direction, um, both for society and for the planet. So that's very promising. But there is still uh, a lot of people to convert, as you say, even to that notion of what future we want to, to have to live in uh, for ourselves and for future generations. So just getting a shared vision um, that we can all buy into and, uh, <clears throat> and really agree on would be a huge step. Then in terms of the narrative around culture and the role that culture can play within that, that vision, um, I think there's a spectrum and there are different approaches and, and I, there's value in, in each of those. The intrinsic value of culture and supporting the cultural sector and artists to do what they 
do best and to express themselves in their own ways is really important. But also looking at how we as intermediaries and a lot of the people on the calls today in, in this, these panels have been networks, NGOs, um, practitioners, researchers, policymakers, people representing lots of different um, aspects of culture, heritage sector, as well as cultural sector, um, and, and that wider sense of the way that we live. And, and I, we have a privilege to be in those intermediary spaces between communities and artists and, and cultural activists and those policy makers. And, and I think that's a privilege that we should use to our advantage. There are so many platforms, um, including Mondia Cult, where we can try and influence and uh, influence the thinking, the narrative, um, but as well cooperate between us and come to some some shared vision and commonalities in the way that we see things. I think Ayeta, your diagram is really helpful. Um, and I think that both you and Ege were talking about culture at the heart, at the center. Um, and I really like that, that image. And I think 2030 is the kind of fictional, fictitious deadline uh, that we set ourselves. But I mean, uh, the world won't stop in 2030, it, it will continue. So we really need to think about how we can cooperate beyond 2030 and start thinking about um, what cooperation, cultural cooperation looks like beyond 2030, not just where does culture fit in uh, into the development sphere, but how can we <clears throat> work together, provide that solidarity and financial and uh, and other ways of supporting culture to be part of the solutions um, and not part of the problem. That's great. Thank you, Rosanna. That's, it, it's really heartening, everything everyone is saying. And it's interesting, we're going to come to the questions from uh, Slido in a moment, so please keep them coming in. Um, but I think we possibly answered one of them, which is, do we need ambassadors for culture in the same way as we have ambassadors for um, UNICEF and so on. And I think the answer is, from what everybody is saying, absolutely yes. We need to tell this story beautifully. Uh, may, maybe maybe we need Burner Boy to be uh, the advocate and ambassador for, for arts and culture rather than Pepsi. Um, controversial statement. Um, now, we're going to a Slido poll um, and we're going to ask you a question uh, again on Slido. Back to who are you, uh, people who are joining us? Uh, people who are, are watching and listening. Uh, there's a, it's a multiple choice. Uh, you, you can go with artist, cultural manager, promoter, policymaker, and so on, uh, with the ever popular I, other, available. Um, so please just jump on there and tell us who you are and so we know who we're sharing our time with. Thank you. Great, we've got some, uh, we've got quite a lot of NGOs, charities, civil society. Oh no, they're dropping. No, they're rising again. I've realized this goes fast and I probably shouldn't just comment on the movement of the bars. Um, yes, absolutely. A lot of cultural management, um, good number of artists out there, which is excellent. Policymakers, keep telling us about that. While um, I move to our next question, um, which is, uh, which I'm gonna take from Slido. Um, and it's a question about the global uh, north and the global south, uh, whether, whether one looks at that, uh, however one looks at that, but including obviously um, uh, Asia within, uh, within that. What can we, the global north, uh, assume, uh, for, the, for those from the global north, what can we be learning from the global south? And, and also, what can the global north be doing to support? What's the, what's the next thing we need to be doing? Um, and I'd like to ask that question uh, to Ege. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, another good one. <laughs> well, um, I'm uh, positioned in Turkey, uh, which is probably somewhere in the middle of the north and south. So maybe I'll try to channel that kind of hybrid situation in, in, in Turkey, which is technically Europe, but we have so many global south problems uh, these days, especially. Um, and before I forget, I want to Say, talk about two concepts um, that are relevant for us. Um, we talked about a shared vision and narrative, and um, one thinks about how exciting the SDGs as a narrative already are. I mean, they're very 
um, uh, mobilizing. Everybody's so enthusiastic. And all those countries signed up to it, actually, North and South. And it's quite miraculous. I don't think they knew what they were signing up for, or they would not have signed up for it, because nobody's delivering sincerely. And my, so one uh, concept is sincerity that I want to talk about. Um, I think it, it applies to both the North and South. Maybe these divisions are a little um, uh, artificial sometimes. I mean, in terms of, let's say, uh, maybe decolonization, the North-South um, and indigenous rights, the North-South uh, polarity might be very um, central. But uh, in, in, uh, in governance terms, in how society works, especially how we're, being, uh, we're globalizing so much, um, especially with emerging um, big economies, they are looking more and more like um, northern uh, global north consumers with the same aspirations. With, and so they're going to, well, we're facing in the future the same problems may, maybe in the global south that the global north, maybe more depression, um, more uh, loss of meaning with consumerism, um, like more first world problems of suicide maybe. I mean, I, I'm just um, thinking aloud here. So we have to look at, I think, um, shared problems um, and look at, that's why the SDGs are for the whole world, not just for the global south like the MDGs were, you know, mainly. And the second um, concept I don't want to forget about is uh, actually the duality of hope and despair. In my country, um, I, I'm not going to censor myself, we have a lot of despair. Um, uh, in certain um, certain um, communities, uh, feel very oppressed. We have authoritarianism problems, the rising far right. This is again not only a developing or mid middle income country problem. You know, also in Europe we have the, um, these kinds of uh, populism governance problems. Um, and uh, I, I find a lot of hope in sustainable development. I mean, working in sustainable development gives me a lot of optimism and hope because I, I'm exposed to the potential and the information and the solutions that are possible and my, a lot of my friends don't have that exposure so they don't understand why i'm an optimist <laughs> so I, maybe we just need to um keep communicating um uh, and and uh, try to um you know disperse this this uh, general lo uh, feeling of despair that also causes less or organizing um and less activism and um, less uh, less resilience in terms of fighting the good fights you know, um, I think this also right. comes, you know, sorry, I go on a, a very long, but uh, north-south divide, I mean, um, I don't know. Um, uh, let me give a pause there. I, I don't have a No, that's fantastic. That, but... That's fantastic. I was speaking um, a couple of weeks ago with the uh, new director of the International African American Museum in Charleston, which is on the land where 40 to 60 percent of enslaved Africans landed when they arrived in the US. And she said, you have to be able to go between joy and despair all the time and hold them at the same time. We can't have joy on Monday, despair Tuesday. You can't schedule these things. You have to deal with the whole of life. And I suspect that's exactly uh, what arts and culture can do. Um, I had to, uh, my question, a question of globalization really, uh, from, from where you stand, uh, obviously, there has been a real uh, diversity of culture across the world. There's also been uh, homogenization um, uh, with same things everywhere. But actually, again, there seems to be more diversity within the global south and the north. What's your sense of the role of culture as an individual statement of a place and a people? And to what degree do you think there's opportunities with that kind of internationalization? Um... <clears throat> So, of course, uh, uh, we all know that uh, with 1989 came globalization. I remember when growing up, uh, we all had one TV, one uh, you know, television program that you're watching. Everyone is watching the same thing. And so there was kind of uh, less diversity growing up than we have now. And sometimes it gets a little confusing as to what should I be watching now? And uh, are we losing that sense of uh, national identity or community identity when we have so much coming out, coming in from elsewhere and of course from Africa and uh, so the media. And so the media has played a role in, uh, in, in enhancing cultural diversity. But at the same time, there's something of course we are also losing in that sense of uh, uh, having a national identity like we used to have when we had one television station 
and uh, we watch news at the same time. So with globalization comes that, but the good thing is that, <clears throat> of course, it provides uh, an, op an opportunity for diversity. But I wanted to say something uh, with regards to the concept of uh, Ubuntu in Africa, uh, which is uh, an idea that many people kind of try to hang on to when they feel like maybe we are losing our African identity because of so much diversity that is coming into Africa. But at the same time, remember that uh, the characteristics of uh, Ubuntu are also connected more to socialism rather than capitalism. And so there's that confusion, especially now that we are within this uh, framework, the um, neoliberal uh, hegemony, whereby it's, it's about diversity, it's about, you know, so Africa seems to be, you know, kind of confused as to what to hang on. And I was uh, kind of, you know, intrigued by a concept that I came across called Afro-capitalism. Uh, and it's also tapping into the Ubuntu idea, uh, whereby you're saying we have cultural, you know, uh, harmony, but at the same time, let us exist within a capitalistic system. And then there are those critics who are saying, no, 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 that's not what we need on the African continent. Uh, we need to move more towards some kind of solidarity, uh, some kind of uh, corporatism, social, uh, not really socialism, but some kind of uh, cooperativism, uh, whereby uh, we are not fooled by the whole idea of capitalism and we lose the whole idea of uh, being together. So I think we, we, Africa is a point of um, decision making as what do we really want to connect us? Because before uh, colonization, the Ubuntu idea was clear within traditional Africa. When we got, uh, you know, colonization comes in, it brings new cultures. And then now with globalization, bringing the, the different diverse cultures, we are still struggling as to uh, holding our heads above the water so that our cultural identity uh, does not disappear. So that's what I wanted to add. To that's that. fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ayeta. Um, I, I'm really, I'm really struck by that journey from um, from Ubuntu to Afropunk. In effect, the idea, the idea of of uh, culture assimilating, but also then growing back out again as a capitalist action. And I think we all suffer in the arts and, and culture world as um, being the first people to question ourselves. So that that kind of uh, the fact that we will always ask the big difficult questions rather than stating the facts that are convincing. Um, a question to Pierre Luigi. Um, uh, of those questions, what are the questions we need to be asking? You talked. Um, I've heard you talk previously about about Maslow and about uh, the role of culture. How do we make that um, narratively as well as quantitatively and qualitatively compelling? Well, in culture, we have a, a lot of really compelling anecdotes. Uh, we have stories, and uh, these stories are often very beautifully uh, presented. But the problem is that uh, to really have uh, an uptake of this perspective in the decision maker making centers, we need evidence. And uh, of course, now we are gathering an increasing amount of evidence in this regard. We have. Uh, beautiful clinical research, for example, on the impacts of cultural participation on so many different health domains. We have randomized studies, for example, on the impact of culture and social cohesion and empathy. We have uh, an increasing amount of, uh, of, of studies on how behavioral change is driving, for example, responsible prosocial uh, environmental behaviors that are mediated through cultural experiences. The problem is to, uh, in some sense, on one side, overcome the diffidence that many people in the cultural sphere have towards this. Even if, uh, as if, I mean, um, a study that uh, puts numbers into this is somehow betraying or distorting what is the ineffable nature of, uh, of cultural experiences. Of course, we know that the culture is a very subtle and, 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 and complex and multi-layered experience. But if we understand some aspects, that can be communicated with numbers, knowing that, of course, this does not exhaust the complexity of culture. Why not? And the second point is uh, really 
mainstreaming this uh, into the really important channels that policymakers use to, to make decisions. For example, it's very difficult still today to have, uh, for example, studies like this that really arrive to the main global uh, scientific platforms. We know that in the end, what really makes a change is uh, when you arrive uh, on, for example, those scientific journals that are, uh, in some sense, with their authority, already creating a, a, a credibility uh, asset that can be deployed. For example, uh, now there is a big explosion of video games uh, related research in Alzheimer treatment because there was uh, back in the days now a few years ago a lead article in nature that showed very clearly that a certain specifically designed video games were uh, dramatically improving for example the, the the resistance of elderly people to cognitive decay to alzheimer that's exactly the the, the breakthroughs that we need and uh, i think that from this point of view a closer and closer collaboration between uh, cultural practitioners, professionals, artists, and scientists, especially behavioral scientists for the future, I think is one of the most promising and exciting lines of research. That's great. Thank you, Pierluigi. Um, Trinidad, if we are looking at getting to a destination, uh, really moving things on, having made a transformational difference by 2030 and into 2035, what do you think are the two main milestones we should be aiming for along the way? How will we know if we're on the right track? Boy, this is difficult, <laughs> but uh, but probably I would I would uh, continue what uh, Pierluigi was saying. So one of the things that I was uh, talking before that we have to talk and we have to have a narrative towards the, the policy makers, but also I'm going to contradict myself, but, uh, but now I, we also have to preach to our choir because our choir, so the cultural sector, must to be prepared to really work with these scientists, to really work with these um, policy makers, to really work in the educational sector, in the health sector, in tra transport, in all the different aspects uh, of our society. And this means that we, we have to be prepared so that the cultural sector has to be prepared. I think when we start seeing more uh, what uh, Pierluigi was saying and not as um, uh, white flies <laughs> kind of examples, but something that is much more mainstream, that will be one of the milestones that uh, we're going to see. And, and then coming back to my, my uh, if we, we see more intersectoral or interministerial uh, policies, uh, that that could help the whole sector uh, that will be another milestone for 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 us it's, it's like when we see the minister of culture sitting much more in the center that's fantastic <laughs> thank, you. thank you trinidad um rosanna i uh, i'd like to i'd like to to turn to you and ask ask could you could you You've heard all of this, and, and and you obviously have been involved in this conversation as everyone has. But as really as a, as an interlocutor, as someone who whose job is to pull, what are you hearing? What do you think are the patterns? What what's the most important lessons we can take from this conversation? Thanks. Yeah, I I have picked up on a few kind of recommendations and and calls to action that seem to be emerging. Um, on the one hand, we're saying that we need to sort of train or raise awareness with policymakers of the role of arts and culture and continue doing that advocacy work that we've been doing across sectors, engaging with different types, of including finance, um, education, environment, um, health, but also that certain cultural leaders and cultural organizations and actors need help to bridge that gap and and situate their work within wider whether it's local national or global policies and and organizations like the british council but like a lot of the the people on these panels as i mentioned can play a part in making that happen um, <clears throat> another key point is around how we should improve the communication um, the storytelling the advocacy uh, work across sectors and and bring that hope, imagination, creativity to life so that people really understand and engage um, and participate in cultural life in a way that makes sense to them, that is relevant, 
I like Ege's word, uh, sincere, um, <clears throat> and intergenerational, uh, which we haven't really touched on in this conversation, how to bring young people on this journey, but also learn from young people and for them to learn from, from past generations or, or our elders. Um, and then the third one around uh, what Pierluigi was saying, that we do need to keep measuring, that there are brilliant study, studies, statistics um, out there and uh, a way we do need to keep measuring what we treasure and not just treasure what we measure. And that's something that Gabriela Ramos said um, recently at, at the Forum on Global Challenges in Birmingham. And I really believe that, that that is something that we need to do, but we also um, need to make sure that we're finding new ways of measuring and, and a new way of operating that values the authentic stories and, and not just the hard data. Um, and in terms of future thinking for transformational change, there is a new movement and a trend towards um, this concept and it's quite interesting that the um, RSA is doing their work on collective futures for people and planet. Um, the UN is organizing a 2023 summit on, on, uh, of the future. And um, the sec as Emmanuel mentioned, the Secretary General would really like to bring culture into the, the notion of global public good. Um, there are really positive trends um, in the role that culture plays in policies, um, such as at the G20, having the first declaration on culture. But, you know, and there's so many positive stories that are emerging from the sector and from the bottom up as well that can inform policy. So those are just some of the thoughts, but in terms of what creativity and culture can do for that future that we want to imagine is to provide that sense of hope, imagination, uh, bringing a design way of thinking and reflection to raise awareness, um, take action, um, encourage collectivity and that cooperative approach that I yet mentioned, and to foster expression and um, connection with people and different cultures. So it's something that we all need to hold on to and keep the faith, keep that hope, uh, and hopefully some of that will be translated during Mondia Cult. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rosanna, for that. Um, it's been a fantastic session. I, I've been really struck by uh, by many things. Uh, I've been struck by our need to really communicate our narrative, to to think about what's, what is the best storytelling we can possibly have for the non-committed. Um, it strikes me that we do need to think about who our ambassadors are, and we need to think about our script and make sure that really we get together, even though we all, we're all we all improvisers and we all say, uh, we all know that what we're doing, we do need a script, because without that, if things begin to go wrong, we just don't know what to pivot back to. We need to think about interministerial work um, and, and what can culture do for them? How how can we tell the story of culture and creativity <clears throat> in a way that actually gives them the solutions they need? Uh, we have to be the, the easy solution rather than uh, the difficult child uh, screaming for attention. How do we measure what we're doing in new ways? Uh, and, and how do we uh, just ensure that every story we tell is about culture uh, as an asset for the common good for safer and prosperous societies? So. It's been a great session. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, our panelists, uh, Ege Yildirim, Ayeta Wanguza, Trinidad Salvador, Pierre Luigi Sacco, and Rosanna Lewis, and say quickly what happens next. Um, from now, what we will do is we will we will study this. We'll think about what we've heard today, um, and the British Council and the World Cities Culture Forum will tie it together to bring uh, both a report, but also to bring specific recommendations that will go to ministers at Mondia Cult uh, in September in Mexico. Um, they will. There'll be another session in uh, almost four weeks' time, uh, which will be based around. Uh, announcing one of the reports that's been written, but also a conversation very specifically about South America uh, and the Caribbean. 
And um, from there, all it remains me to say is thank you to the team here. It's been a really exciting day. It's been six brilliant hours with some of the most extraordinary speakers I've seen in as long as I can remember. Um, the team behind the scenes have been completely fantastic. British Council, World City Culture Forum, everybody involved um, and uh, talking to the people from UNESCO. It's been, it's been thrilling. The technical team who have made this look so slick um, which of course it has been. Uh, there have been no technical hitches at all from anybody else aside from the 19 different countries we've spoken from uh, across 72 different types of devices. Um, but they have made everything look so beautiful. Um, and finally to you, uh, the people who've been joining us all day, watching us, asking brilliant questions, telling us who you are. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Don't wrap me up with a one minute to go.